Chapter number twenty nine of Stories of Symphonic Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Stories of Symphonic Music by Lawrence Gilman. Section twenty nine Sibelius. Jan Sibelius, born in Tavastahus, Finland, December 8, 1865, now living in Hellingsenfors. Lemminkainen, symphonic poem in four parts, opus 22. The Swan of Tuonela, Lemminkainen's home fairing. Sibelius, some time prior to February 1906, informed Mrs. Rosa Newmarch, the author of the first authoritative study in English of the Finnish composer, that he was writing a symphonic poem in four parts under the general title Lemminkainen, based on episodes in the Kalevala. Footnote. Elias Lonerot, the Finnish scholar, issued the Kavela, a word which signifies the dwelling of the heroes, son of Kavela, the Walhalla of Scandinavian mythology, the result of his researches and labors among the national folklore of the Finns in 1835. The Kalevala depicts the ancient Finnish people as a race of free barbarians endowed with many noble qualities, whose religion was a mild nature worship, demanding no blood sacrifices. The primitive inhabitants of Finland, or Suomi, as it is still called in the vernacular, believed that all objects in nature were inhabited and ruled by invisible deities. They had more faith in the word than in the sword. Therefore, the bard and the rune singer, he who possessed the word of origin, was more honored by them than the warrior, the shedder of blood. For them, the word of origin lay concealed in the heart of nature. This tendency to seek mind in the visible world is also characteristic of all the literature and art of modern Finland. It has been transmitted to a whole series of poets, whither, like Runeberg, Franzen, and the elder Topelius, they sang in Swedish, or adopted the Finnish idiom with Lonrot and his successors. To this imaginative people, the making of songs was part of existence, almost a primal instinct. Of the three principal personages of the Kalevala, Vain on Moen, the Finnish Orpheus, stands out as the ideal hero of the race. Profound wisdom and power of magical song are his special attributes. Rosa Newmarch and Footnote Two of these parts have been produced, the Swan of Tuonela and Lemminkainen's home fairing. The others are said to be still, 1907, incomplete. Of the two completed portions, Mrs. Newmarch writes as follows. The Swan of Tuonela. Tuonela was the name of the Finnish Hades. Those wending their way to the final abode had to traverse nine seas and one river, the equivalent of the Styx whereon sang and floated the sacred swan. The long-necked graceful swimmer, swimming in the black death river, in the sacred stream and whirlpool. The majestic but intensely sad swan melody is heard as a solo for cor anglais, English horn, accompanied at first by muted strings and the soft roll of drums. Now and then this melody is answered by a phrase given to cello or viola, which might 
be interpreted as the farewell sigh of some soul passing to tuonella for many bars the brass is silent until suddenly the first horn muted echoes a few notes of the swan melody with the most poignant effect gradually the music works up to a great climax followed by a treble pianissimo the strings playing with the back of the bow to this accompaniment which suggests the faint flapping pinions the swan's final phrases are sung the strings return to the natural bowing and the work ends in one of the characteristic sighing phrases for the cello lemminkainen's home fairing it was in pursuit of the swan of tuonela that lemminkainen the reckless magician hero of the cavella lost his life the capture of the sacred bird was the last test of his courage and devotion before he could win the bride of his heart but nashut the crippled shepherd who bore a grudge against lemminkainen watched for his approach hurled at him a serpent snatched from the death stream and flung him mortally wounded into the coal black waters there the blood-stained son of deathland there's tuoni's son and hero cuts in pieces lemminkainen the finnish hero shares the fate of osiris but the fifteenth rune relates how his aged and faithful mother implores the immortal blacksmith ilmarinen to forge her a huge rake lemminkainen's faithful mother breaks the river of tuoni to her belt in mud and water deeper deeper rakes the death stream rakes the river's deepest caverns by untiring perseverance she recovers all the missing members knits them together by her incantations and finally restores her son to life when his thoughts revert to the woman he loves for whose sake he has accomplished a series of heroic exploits his mother persuades him in these words let the swan swim on in safety in the whirlpool of tuoni leave the maiden in the northland with her charms and fading beauty with thy fond and faithful mother go at once to kalevala to thy native fields and follows footnote this and the preceding verse translations are from the english version of the kalevala by john martin crawford End footnote. then the hero consoled by the maternal love which inflicts no sting and exacts no useless sacrifices starts on his homeward way end of section 29 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 30 of stories of symphonic music this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Stories of Symphonic Music by Lawrence Gilman Section 30 Smentana Frederick Smentana, born in Litomistel, Bohemia, March 2, 1824, died in Prague, May 12, 1884. My Fatherland a cycle of six symphonic poems. Samantana, an ardent nationalist and incorrigible patriot, composed for the glorification of his country a cycle of six symphonic poems under the general title My Fatherland, Ma Vlast, dedicated to the city of Prague. The titles and the programs, in outline, of the six parts of the cycle are as follows. 1. Weisterhad, 
1874. A famous and historic Bohemian citadel at Prague. The splendid life there in its past day of glory and renown. The poet, at the sight of the fortress, beholds visions of the past. Vicerad rises up before his eyes in its former glory, crowned with gold-decked shrines and the edifices of the Premslide princes and kings, rich in warlike renown. The brave knights assemble in the castle courts, to the sound of cymbals and trumpets, for the festal tourney. Here are drawn up beneath the reflected rays of the sun rows of warriors in rich glittering armor, ready for victorious contests. Whilst contemplating the past glory of the sublime dwelling of princes, the poet sees also its downfall. Unchained passion overthrows the mighty towers in bitter strife, lays waste the glorious sanctuaries and proud princely halls. Instead of inspiring songs and jubilant hymns, Vaishrad is become dumb. A deserted monument of past glory, from its ruins resounds the echo of the long silent song of the singer prince, Lumer, through the mournful stillness. 2. Vlatava, 1874. The river Moldau, the scenes through which the course of the beloved river leads, beauties of nature, historic edifices, deeds and achievement of men, apparitions of nymphs and naiads. 3. Sarka, 1875. Sarka, the noblest of the Bohemian Amazons, was betrayed in love by one of the hated race of men against whom the Amazons wage ceaseless war. Craving vengeance, she has herself bound to a tree and, in simulation of distress, impels the knight of Zyrad, who is swayed by her beauty, to release her. Zyrad and his warrior band, striking camp for the night, fall asleep after the long-continued revels. Sarka then summons her companions by a blast of her horn. They fall furiously upon the sleeping warriors and put them to the sword. 4. From Bohemia's Fields and Groves, 1875 A tonal celebration of natural beauties, music of pastoral character. 5. Tabor, 1878 The Fortress of the Hussites, a sonorous tribute to the Taborites, their valor and their heroic devotion to their cause. 6. Blanick, 1879. The name of the mountain on which are sleeping in glorious death the Hussite warriors, awaiting the resurrection which will restore them to renewed service for the faith. End of section 30. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 31 of Stories of Symphonic Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Symphonic Music by Lawrence Gilman. Section 31 Spohr. Louis Spohr. Born in Braunschweig, Germany, April 5th, 1784. Died in Kassel, November 22nd, 1859. Symphony No. 4, The Consecration of Sound, Opus 86. Footnote. This is the version of Die Weihe der Töne, by which the symphony is generally known in America and England. It has also been called the power of sound. A more precise translation is the consecration of tones. The symphony has this subtitle, a characteristic tone painting 
in the form of a symphony, after a poem by Karl Pfeiffer. End of footnote. 1. Rigid silence of nature before the creation of tone. Largo. Active life after the same. Sounds of nature. Turmoil of the elements. Allegro. 2. Cradle song. Dance. Serenade. Andantino. 3. War music. Going off to battle. Feelings of those left behind. Return of the victors. Prayer of thanksgiving. Tempo di marcia. 4. Funeral music. Larghetto. Consolation in tears. Allegretto. Die Weihe der Töne, composed in 1832, is founded on a poem of the same title by Karl Pfeiffer. In a letter dated October 9, 1832, Spohr wrote, I have lately completed a grand instrumental composition, a fourth symphony, which differs greatly in form from the preceding ones. It is a musical composition inspired by a poem of Karl Pfeiffer's Die Weihe der Töne, which must be printed or recited aloud before it, the symphony, is performed. In the very first part, my task was to construct a harmonious whole out of the sounds of nature. This, as indeed the whole work, was a highly attractive program. Schumann afterwards described it as eulogizing music with music. Pfeiffer's poem is as follows, divided in accordance with its relation to the four movements of the symphony. 1. Rigid silence of nature before the creation of tone, largo. Active life after the same sounds of nature. Turmoil of the elements, allegro. Solitary lay the fields in the flower splendor of spring. Amid the silent forms, wandered man through the night, following only his wild impulse, not the mild footprints of the heart. Love found no tones, nature no language. Then eternal kindness wished to announce itself and breathed sound into the breast of man, and it let love find a language that penetrated to its heart and made it happy. The nightingale greets him with tones of love, The forest rustles forth harmonies to him. The zephyr's murmur fills his breast with longing. The brook's waves whisper him to rest. Then, at the tone's sacred wafting, the spirit, freed from every earthly bond, soars triumphant to the heights of heaven and greets the fair fatherland of dreams. 2. Cradle Song, Dance, Serenade, Anantino Holy tones, sounds of peace from the unknown world, ye are given to us as faithful companions mid life's joy and sternness. At the child's first griefs on its faithful mother's breast, ye already penetrate the little heart and turn the grief to gladness. Ye also invite all puissantly to the merry dance of youth, and the dark cares are hushed and then the jubilant dance rings out. The clouds have flown swiftly from the brow, the befogged spirit grows serene, and, borne lightly on sounding billows, the winged foot hoovers on its way. In the secret husk of night ye sound from the youth's mouth, ye bear tidings of the plenitude of his love to the beloved one. Holy tones, sounds of love, your magic power softens the loved heart's sternness, and the youth's complaint is still. 3. War music. Going off to battle. Feelings of those left behind. Return of the victors. Prayer of thanksgiving. Tempo di marcia. But he call also with the power of inspiration to the melee of battles, teaching the youth to despise life when the trumpet calls to the fight. Cares and fear and dangers vanish behind the triumphant tones, and the fiery glance starts forward to bind the brow with bloody laurels. 
but when you have begun boldly and wildly with the call to fight and the battle song then when the victory is won ye beckon backward with gentle sounds of peace then ye bear on the pinions of devotion the harder love to the eternal god and the victor's joyous chorus teaches us to give thanks to the god of battles four funeral music larghetto consolation in tears allegretto holy tones your peace still follows the tired one down when he parted from the world has sunk silently into his grave ye whisper granting of prayers to the dumb yearning of his loves and to the tearless ye give tears to the departed everlasting rest holy tones are ye fair dreams from the unknown fatherland are ye children of those blessed spaces sent to us as messengers of peace oh never leave me sweet tones may i fancy myself in your home and not think of the fetters that hold me fast end of section thirty one recording by monica m c chapter thirty two of stories of symphonic music this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Symphonic Music by Lawrence Gilman Section 32 Strauss, Part 1 Richard Strauss, born in Munich, June 11, 1864, now living in Berlin. From Italy Symphonic Fantasia, Opus 16 Movement 1 on the Campania, on Dante. Movement 2. Amid Rome's Ruins, Allegro Molto con Brio. Movement 3. On the Shore of Sorrento, Andantino. Movement 4. Neapolitan Folk Life, Allegro Molto. Aus Italia, the first of Strauss's descriptive works for orchestra, was composed in 1886 the year in which the composer visited Rome and Naples. The score is avowedly programmatic, however, only to the extent of the titling of the different movements, except the second, Amid Rome's Ruins, bears this additional superscription. Fantastic pictures of vanished splendor, feelings of sadness and grief in the midst of the sunniest present, of the first movement, Mr. Vernon Blackburn has remarked, The Campania is absolutely destitute of scenery, its tragic secret lying, for the most part, too deep even for the modern explorer. Its dim, warm weather is an attribute which exactly describes its general aspect of loneliness and locked quietude. These are the points which Strauss makes apparent in his music, and proves the constancy of that mood in the second portion of his Fantasia, in which he only completes the hidden tragedy of the Campania, in the section which he has entitled Amid Rome's Ruins. In the third movement, on the shore of Sorrento, Mr. Hermann Kretschmar finds, in the middle portion, a picture of the sea ruffled by the wind. A boat appears, and in it a singer sings a genuine native melody, sprung from the noble Sicilianos, which, since the end of the 17th century, has passed over Europe, journeying from the region near Sorrento. The strings, says another commentator, furnish a rich background for the sparkling flashes of melody which emanate from the other instruments, the whole being suggestive of a water picture. The almost constant shimmer in the strings might easily be construed as a description of the restlessness of the ocean, over which the melodies of the woodwind play, like the glintings of sunlight. In the last movement, Neapolitan Folk Life, the famous song Funiculi Funicula serves as the principal theme, announced by violas and cellos. The finale is brilliant, tumultuous, audacious, my desolation doth begin to make a better life. Such, remarks Mr. Blackburn, 
might have been the motto upon which Strauss has built the labor of this extraordinary work. He makes you feel through every bar how completely his musical spirit is oppressed by a sense of tragic thought, which, if anywhere, is surely appropriate in the presence of the wreckage of that huge civilization which reached the zenith of its glory in the genius of Julius Caesar. Don Juan, Tone Poem, Opus 20 this work is usually placed first on the list of Strauss's remarkable series of tone poems. Yet, though it bears an earlier opus number, it was actually preceded, in point of composition, by Macbeth, opus 23, which was written in 1887, a year earlier than Don Juan. The subject of this tone poem is the Don Juan of Nicholas Linau, 1802 to 1850 and quotations from Lino's poem are prefixed to the score. They are as follows. Don Juan, to Diego, his brother. O magic realm, illimited, eternal, of gloried woman, loveliness, supernal, fain would I, in the storm of stressful bliss, expire upon the last one's lingering kiss. Through every realm, O oh friend, would wing my flight, wherever beauty blooms, kneel down to each, and if for one brief moment win delight. Don Juan to Diego I flee from surfeit and from rapture's cloy, keep fresh for beauty, service, and employ, grieving the one that all I may enjoy. The fragrance from one lip today is breath of spring, the dungeon's gloom perchance to-morrow's luck may bring. When with the new love won I sweetly wander, No bliss is ours upfurbished and regilded. A different love has this to that one yonder. Not up from ruins be my temples builded. Yea, love life is, and ever must be new. Cannot be changed or turned in new direction. It cannot but there expire, here resurrection. And if tis real, it nothing knows of rue. Each beauty in the world is soul, unique. So must the love be that would beauty seek. So long as youth lives on with pulse of fire, Out to the chase, to victories new aspire. Don Juan to Marcello, his friend. It was a wondrous lovely storm that drove me. Now it's over and calm all around above me. Sheer dead is every wish, all hopes over shrouded. T'was perhaps a flash from heaven that so descended, whose deadly stroke left me with powers ended, and all the world so bright before over clouded. And yet perhaps not, exhausted is the fuel, and on the hearth the cold is fiercely cruel. Linau is said to have observed of his creation, My Don Juan is not hot-blooded man eternally pursuing women. It is the longing in him to find a woman who is to him incarnate womanhood, and to enjoy in the one all the women on earth whom he cannot as individuals possess. Because he does not find her, although he reels from one to another, at last disgust seizes hold of him, and this disgust is the devil that fetches him. Elaborate and inexorably detailed commentaries have been written on Strauss's tone poem, yet this brief exposition by Mr. Philip Hale is more truly illuminating than are the exhaustive excursions of the German analysts. Linus' hero is a man who seeks the sensual ideal. He is constantly disappointed. He is repeatedly disgusted with himself, men and women and the world. And when at last he fights a duel with Don Pedro, the avenging son of the Grand Commander, he throws away his sword and lets his adversary kill him. Mein Tod fiend ist in meiner Faust gegeben. Dach dies auch langweilt wie das ganze Leben. My deadly foe is in my power, but this too bores me, as does life itself. 
of the tragic end of the don's insatiable experimenting as strauss has turned it into music he says till the end the mood grows wilder and wilder there is no longer time for regret and soon there will be no time for longing it is the carnival and don juan drinks deep of wine and love surrounded by women overcome by wine he rages in passion and at last falls unconscious gradually he comes to his senses the themes of the apparitions rhythmically disguised as in fantastic dress pass like sleep chasings through his brain and then there is the motive of disgust some find in the next episode the thought of the cemetery with don juan's reflections and his invitation to the statue here the jaded man finds solace in bitter reflection at the feast surrounded by gay company there is a faint awakening of longing but he exclaims the fire of my blood has now burned out then comes the duel with the death scene the theme of disgust now dominates there is a tremendous orchestral crash there is a long and eloquent silence a pianissimo chord in a minor is cut into by a piercingly dissonant trumpet f and then there is a last sigh a mourning dissonance and resolution trombones to e minor exhausted is the fuel and on the hearth the cold is fiercely cruel macbeth tone poem opus twenty three macbeth turn dichting für grosses orchestra nach shakespeare's drama was composed in eighteen eighty seven it is actually in date of composition the first of strauss's orchestral tone poems though don juan see the preceding pages composed in eighteen eighty eight bears an earlier opus number twenty beyond the title and the acknowledgment after shakespeare's drama the score bears no program or explanation save the word macbeth printed over an imperious phrase for violins horn and woodwind near the beginning and a quotation from the play in german placed above a passage on page eleven of the orchestral score where flutes and clarinets pianissimo give out over muted horns and strings tremolo a phrase whose expression is marked appassionata molto rubato the quotation is from lady macbeth's speech in act one scene five hie thee hither that i may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal German analysts have been, as in the case of all of Strauss's needlessly and perversely recondite program music, at pains to explore the music of Macbeth, and have written with lavish detail in exposition of its significance. The end of it all appears to be that in this tone poem, Strauss has not attempted to illustrate the external events of Shakespeare's tragedy, but has endeavored to portray the character of its protagonist, Macbeth himself, and the struggle which goes on within his soul. Death and Transfiguration Tone Poem Opus 24 Prefaced to the published score of Tod und Verklärung, composed in 1889, is a poem by the German musician Alexander Ritter, which was written after the author had become acquainted with Strauss's music, and under its inspiration. That the verses were included by Strauss in the printed score is sufficient evidence that he regards them as an adequate interpretation of the emotional plan underlying his music. The subject of this tone poem is the human soul at grip with death, fronting imminent dissolution and reviewing feverishly the memorable phases of its past. Childhood, youth, love, conflict, strife, aspiration, despair, interrupted by desperate struggles with the destroyer. At the moment of the death, there is the beginning of triumph, deliverance from the world, transfiguration, 
Ritter's poem, translated into English prose by Mr. W. F. Apthorpe, is as follows. In the necessitous little room, dimly lighted by only a candle end, lies the sick man on his bed, but just now he has wrestled despairingly with death. Now he has sunk exhausted into sleep, and thou hearest only the soft ticking of the clock on the wall in the room, whose awful silence gives a foreboding of the nearness of death. Over the sick man's pale features plays a sad smile. Dreams he, on the boundary of life, of the golden time of childhood? But death does not long grant sleep and dreams to his victim. Cruelly he shakes him awake, and the fight begins afresh. Will to live and power of death. What frightful wrestling. Neither bears off the victory, and all is silent once more. Sunk back, tired of battle, sleepless, as in fever frenzy, the sick man now sees his life pass before his inner eye. Trait by trait, and scene by scene, First the morning red of childhood, shining bright in pure innocence. Then the youth's saucier play, exerting and trying his strength, till he ripens to the man's fight, and now burns with hot lust after the higher prizes of life. The one high purpose that has led him through life was to shape all he saw transfigured into a still more transfigured form. Cold and sneering, the world sets barrier upon barrier in the way of his achievement. If he thinks himself near his goal, a halt thunders in his ear. Make the barrier thy stirrup, even higher and onward go. And so he pushes forward, so he climbs, desists not from his sacred purpose. What he has ever sought with his heart's deepest yearning, he still seeks in his death sweat. Seeks, alas, and finds it never. Whether he comprehends it more clearly, or that it grows upon him gradually, he can yet never exhaust it, cannot complete it in his spirit. Then clangs the last stroke of death's iron hammer, breaks the earthly body in twain, covers the eye with the night of death. But from the heavenly spaces sounds mightily to greet him what he yearningly sought for here, deliverance from the world, transfiguration of the world. The music, for purposes of elucidation, may be divided into five connected sections. We see the sick man lying exhausted upon his bed in the little candlelit room. He has just wrestled wildly with death. He smiles faintly, dreaming of his youth. Abruptly, death renews the attack, and the dreadful struggle is resumed. There is gradual exhaustion, and once more a respite comes to the sufferer. Now he is visited by dreams and hallucinations, memories of his youth, of young manhood and its vicissitudes, of lusty conflict and passionate endeavor, with illusory glimpses of future triumph. But again, death attacks his victim. There is a short and furious struggle, a sudden subsidence, a mysterious and sinister gong stroke, a portentous silence signifies the final stilling of the heart. Then begins gradually and gravely the transfiguration, and through shimmering harps and sonorous chantings of the brass is suggested the final triumphant attainment of the soul released. Till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks Opus 28 The full title of this work is Till Eulenspiegel's Lustige Steiche nach alter Schelmenweise in Rondo form Figurosis Orchester Gesetz von Ichet Strauss Translated according to the most reasonable authority, this means Till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks set in the old-fashioned, roguish manner, in the form of a rondo, for grand orchestra by Richard Strauss. 
This sufficiently formidable announcement introduced to the world in 1895, the year of its completion and publication, a work which its author sought, after his usual habit, to imbue with a kind of mystification, the point and savor of which it is a little difficult to appreciate. When the, quote, Rondo was produced at Colm, November 15, 1895, Dr. Franz Wilner, who conducted the performance, requested Strauss to furnish an explanatory program of the piece. The composer declined. It is impossible, he said, for me to furnish a program to Eulenspiegel, were I to put into words the thoughts which its several incidents suggested to me, they would seldom suffice, and might even give rise to offense. Let me leave it, therefore, to my hearers to crack the hard nut which the rogue has prepared for them. By way of helping them to a better understanding, it seems sufficient to point out the two Eulenspiegel motives which in the most manifold disguises, moods, and situations pervade the whole up to the catastrophe, when, after he has been condemned to death, Till is strung up to the gibbet. For the rest, let them guess at the musical joke which a rogue has offered them. The three motives indicated by Strauss were the opening theme of the introduction, the horn theme that follows almost immediately, and the descending interval that is said to be expressive of condemnation and the scaffold. Till Eulenspiegel, better known to English readers as Till Owlglass, is the prank-playing vagabond hero of a 15th-century German Volksbuch whose authorship is attributed to Dr. Thomas Murner, 1475-1530. Till, according to Dr. Murner, was born at Neithlinger, Brunswick, in 1283, and died of the plague at Mölln near Lübeck in 1350, or 1353, after wanderings through Germany, Italy, and Poland. Till's exploits, the stories of which are household words in Germany, consisted of mischievous pranks and jests that he practiced without discrimination, and in some instances with a frank and joyous absence of delicate sentiment, which can best be described as Rabelaisian. In Murner's tale, Till is sentenced to the gallows, but escapes death at the last moment. Strauss, however, does not let his hero off, and permits him to die on the scaffold. Despite his disinclination to furnish an elucidation of his music, Strauss has apparently given his sanction to an analysis of the score prepared by Mr. Wilhelm Klatte, as this is full, explicit, and seemingly authoritative, it is quoted here, in part, as follows, in an English translation attributed to Mr. C. A. Barry. A strong sense of German folk feeling pervades the whole work. The source from which the tone poet drew his inspiration is clearly indicated in the introductory bars, Gemächlich, Andante Komodo. To some extent, this stands for the once upon a time of the storybooks. That what follows is not to be treated in the pleasant and agreeable manner of narrative poetry, but in a more sturdy fashion, is at once made apparent by a characteristic bassoon figure which breaks in upon the piano of the strings. Of equal importance for the development of the piece is the immediately following humorous horn theme, Beginning quietly and gradually becoming more lively, it is at first heard against a tremolo of the divided violins, and then again in the first tempo. Ser lepaft, vivaci. This theme, or at least the kernel of it, is taken up in turn by oboes, clarinets, violas, cellos, and bassoons, and is finally brought by the full orchestra, except trumpets and trombones, after a few bars crescendo to a fortissimo. The thematic material, according to the main point, has now been fixed upon. The milieu is given by which we are enabled to recognize the pranks and droll tricks which the crafty schemer is about to bring before our eyes, or far 
rather before our ears. Here he is, clarinet phrase followed by chord for wind instruments. He wanders through the land as a thorough-going adventurer, his clothes are tattered and torn, a queer, fragmentary version of the Eulenspiegel motif resounds from the horns. The rogue, putting on his best manners, slyly passes through the gate and enters a certain city. It is market day. The women sit at their stalls and prattle, flutes, oboes, and clarinets. Hop! Eulenspiegel springs on his horse, indicated by rapid triplets extending through three measures, gives a smack of his whip and rides into the midst of the crowd. Clink, clash, clatter. A confused sound of broken pots and pans, and the market women are put to flight. In haste, the rascal rides away, and is admirably illustrated by a fortissimo passage for the trombones, and secures a safe retreat. This was his first merry prank. A second follows immediately. Gimechich, andante commodo. Eulenspiegel has put on the vestments of a priest and assumes a very unctuous mien. Though posing as a preacher of morals, the rogue peeps out from the folds of his mantle. The Eulenspiegel motif on the clarinet points to the impostor. He fears for the success of his scheme. A figure played by muted violins, horns, and trumpets makes it plain that he does not feel comfortable in his borrowed plumes, but soon he makes up his mind, away with all the scruples, he tears them off. Again the Eulenspiegel theme is brought forward in the previous lively tempo, but is now subtly metamorphosed and chivalrously colored. Eulenspiegel has become a Don Juan, and he waylays pretty women, and one has bewitched him. Eulenspiegel is in love. Hear how, now glowing with love, the violins, clarinets, and flutes sing, but in vain. His advances are received with derision, and he goes away in a rage. How can one treat him so slightingly? Is he not a splendid fellow? Vengeance on the whole human race. He gives vent to his rage in a fortissimo of horns in unison, followed by a pause, and strange personages suddenly draw near cellos. A troop of honest, worthy Philistines. In an instant all of his anger is forgotten, but it is still his chief joy to make fun of these lords and protectors of blameless decorum, to mock them as is apparent from the lively and accentuated fragments of the theme, sounded at the beginning by the horn, which are now heard first from horns, violins, cellos, and then from trumpets, oboes, and flutes. Now that Eulenspiegel has had his joke, he goes away, and leaves the professors and doctors behind in thoughtful meditation. Fragments of the typical theme of the Philistines are here treated canonically. The woodwind, violins, and trumpets suddenly project the Eulenspiegel theme into their profound philosophy. It is as though the transcendent rogue were making faces at the bigwigs from a distance, again and again, and then waggishly running away. This is aptly characterized by a short episode in a hopping 2-4 rhythm, which similarly with the first entrance of the hypocrisy themed previously used, is followed by phantom-like tones from the woodwind and strings, and then from trombones and horns. Has our rogue still no foreboding? Interwoven with the very first theme, indicated lightly by trumpets and English horn, a figure is developed from the second introductory and fundamental theme, it is first taken up by the clarinets. It seems to express the fact that the arch-villain has again got the upper hand of Eulenspiegel, who has fallen into his old manner of life. A merry jester, a born liar, Eulenspiegel goes wherever he can succeed with a hoax. His insolence knows no bounds. Alas, there is a sudden jolt to his wanton humor. The drum rolls, a hollow roll. 
the jailer drags the rascally prisoner into the criminal court the verdict guilty is thundered against the brazen-faced knave the eulenspiegel theme replies calmly to the threatening chords of wind and lower strings eulenspiegel lies again the threatening tones resound but eulenspiegel does not confess his guilt on the contrary he lies for the third time his jig is up fear seizes him the hypocrisy motive is sounded piteously the fatal moment draws near his hour has struck he has danced an air a last struggle flutes and his soul takes flight after sad tremulous pizzicati of the strings the epilogue begins first it is almost identical with the introductory measures which are repeated in full then the most essential parts of the second and third chief theme passages appear and finally merge into a soft chord eulenspiegel has become a legendary character the people tell their tales about him once upon a time but that he was a merry rogue and a real devil of a fellow seems to be expressed by the final eight measures full orchestra fortissimo thus spake zarathustra tone poem opus thirty also sprach zarathustra tondichtung frei nach friedrich nietzsche für großes orchester was begun in february finished in august eighteen ninety six it is as the title implies a tonal rendering of impressions derived from also sprach zarathustra thus spake zarathustra the remarkable philosophico-romantic fantasy of friedrich nietzsche strauss's music is he says frei nach nietzsche that is to say treated freely after nietzsche i did not he has declared intend to write philosophical music or portray nietzsche's great work musically i meant to convey musically an idea of the development of the human race from its origin through the various phases of development religious as well as scientific up to nietzsche's idea of the overman ubermensch a large order one would say whatever strauss may have meant by philosophical music he has certainly whether he intended to or not composed a score which is utterly and hopelessly incomprehensible unless one knows what its relationship is at every point with nietzsche's book a knowledge which strauss is considerately assisted by prefixing to each section of the score an indication of the particular part of the book to which the music refers if this is not translating philosophy into tones or seeking to do so if it is not an endeavor to find musical equivalents for various phases of a particular philosophy a particular chain of ideas then we shall have as it seems to discover a new significance in very ordinary words this is not the place to discuss the pros and cons of the matter or its aspect from the standpoint of musical aesthetics the foregoing observations have been offered only for the purpose of clearing the ground and to prepare the way for the statement which has now to be made that a comprehension of this particular tone poem even with a knowledge of the score and its annotations is impossible without a pretty complete understanding of nietzsche's book and of his outlook upon life and ideas an understanding which it is hardly feasible to attempt to communicate here it is at least possible though to set forth certain of the essentials of his philosophical standpoint and of the characteristics of his zarathustra as a preparation for an acquaintance with the tone poem of strauss and this cannot be better accomplished than by quoting from mr james hunecker's vivid and sympathetic study of the man and his views what does nietzsche teach 
what is his central doctrine divested of its increments of anti-semitism anti-wagnerism anti-christianity and anti-everything else simply a doctrine as old as the first invertebrate organism which floated in torrid seas beneath a blazing moon egoism individualism personal freedom selfhood he is the apostle of the ego he is proclaimer of the rank animalism of man he believes in the body and not in the soul of theology it is in also sprach zarathustra that the genius of nietzsche is best studied like the buddhistic tripitaka it is a book of highly colored oriental aphorisms interrupted by lofty lyric outbursts it is an ironic enigmatic rhetorical rhapsody the third part of a half-mad faust in it may be seen flowing all the currents of modern cultures and philosophies and if it teaches anything at all it teaches the wisdom and beauty of air sky waters and earth and of laughter not pantagruelian but holy laughter the love of earth is preached in rapturous accents a dionysian ecstasy anoints the lips of this latter-day sibyl on his tripod when he speaks of earth he is intoxicated with the fullness of its joys no gloomy monasticism no denial of the will to live no futile thinking about thinking so despised by goethe no denial of grand realities may be found in the curriculum of this bacchantic philosopher a pantheist he is also a poet and seer like william blake and marvels at the symbol of nature the living garment of the deity nietzsche's deity of course it is the history of his soul as leaves of grass is whitman's there are some curious parallelisms between these two subjective epics it is intimate yet hints at universality it contains some of amiel's introspection and some of baudelaire's morbidity half mad yet exhorting comforting hamlet and john bunyan when strauss's also sprach zarathustra was performed in boston in the year following its completion october thirtieth eighteen ninety seven mr w f apthorpe wrote for the program notes of the boston symphony orchestra an analysis and exposition of the work which for completeness and precision could not be well surpassed i reproduce it in part herewith on a fly-leaf of the score is printed the following excerpt from nietzsche's book zarathustra's preface friedrich nietzsche when zarathustra was thirty years old he left his home and the sea of his home and went to the mountains here he enjoyed his mind and his solitude and did not tire thereof for ten years but at last his heart was changed and one morning he rose with the dawn stood before the sun and spake thus to him thou great star what were thy happiness if thou hadst not him whom thou dost illumine for ten years hast thou come here up to my cave thou wouldst have had enough of thy light and of this road without me my eagle and my serpent but we waited thee every morning relieved thee of thy superfluity and blessed thee therefore see i am tired of my wisdom like the bee which has gathered too much honey i need hands that stretch out i would make gifts and divide till the wise among men have once more grown glad of their folly and the poor once more of their riches for this i must go down to the depths as though dost of evenings when thou goest behind the sea and bringest light even to the lower world thou over-rich star like thee i must go down as men call it to them to whom i would descend so bless me then thou placid eye that canst see an over-great happiness without envy 
bless thy beaker which would fain overflow that the water may flow out golden therefrom and carry the reflection of thy ecstasy everywhere see this beaker would fain become empty again and zarathustra would fain become a man again thus began zarathustra's downfall in nietzsche's book zarathustra goes from the mountains down to men and preaches i teach you the overman man is something that must be overcome what have ye done to overcome him the overman is the meaning of the earth man is a rope made fast between the beast and the overman a rope over an abyss a dangerous passing over a dangerous on the way a dangerous staying behind a dangerous shuddering and standing still what is great in man is that he is a bridge and not a purpose what can be loved in man is that he is a transition and a downfall what good and evil is that no one yet knows unless it be he who creates but this one is he who creates man's goal and gives the earth its meaning he alone creates it that something shall be good and evil the great problem zarathustra tries to solve in his speech is to teach men the deification of life all human values must be transvalued and therewith a new order of the universe created beyond good and evil zarathustra himself is this world beyond he is the freest of the free who descries an all becoming only a yearning after his own self and teaching which yearning alone can overcome the simian world and simian mankind slaves of traditional convention and offer to man not the joy of life for there is no such thing but the fullness of life in the joy of the senses in the triumphant exuberance of vitality in the pure lofty naturalness of the antique in short in the fusion of god world and ego this art of life of zarathustra's shall be shared by mankind herein shall zarathustra be dissolved in mankind and go down thus are also to be explained the significant closing words of the fourth chapter of twilight of the idols midday the moment of the shortest shadow the end of the longest error the culminating point of humanity insipid zarathustra taking the excerpt from zarathustra's preface reprinted on the fly-leaf of the score as his poetic text strauss has illustrated it in his own way perhaps it were best not to attempt a metaphysical romantic analysis of the work but to leave this to the listener's imagination after putting before him the composer's preface it will be well however to give some sub-captions which strauss has put at various points of the score just after the great fortissimo outburst of the full orchestra and organ on the chord of c major stands of the dwellers in the rear world these were fools and pietarians who sought the solution in religion once zarathustra too cast his delusion beyond humankind like all dwellers in the rear world the world then seemed to be the work of a suffering and tormented god the world then seemed to me a dream a god's poem i too once cast my delusion beyond humankind ah ye brothers this god whom i created was the work of a man and an insanity like all gods further on we find the subcaption of the great yearning over a strenuous ascending passage in the cellos and bassoons answered by the woodwind this refers to the following passage in nietzsche's book wouldst thou not weep not weep out thy purple despondency then must thou sing o my soul sing with boisterous song till all seas grow still that they may listen to thy yearning already glowest thou and dreamest already drinkest thou thirstily at all deep-sounding springs of comfort already dost thy despondency find its rest in the beatitude of songs to come 
over the expressive pathetic cantilena in c minor of the second violins oboes and horn stands of joys and passions further on we come to the grave song a tenderly expressive cantilena in the oboe over the yearning motif in the cellos and bassoons yonder is the island of graves the silent one yonder too are the graves of my youth thither will i carry an evergreen wreath of life resolving this in my heart i journeyed across the sea o oh, ye sights and apparitions of my youth o oh, all ye love glances ye divine moments how soon are ye dead to me i think of you to-day as of my dead ones to kill me did they wring your necks ye songbirds of my hopes yea at you ye dearest ones did malice ever aim its shafts to hit my heart over the fugued passage beginning in the cellos and double basses stands of science it is to be noted as a musical curiosity that the subject of this fugue contains all the diatonic and chromatic degrees of the scale considerably further on where a violent passage in the strings beginning in the cellos and violas soars up stands the convalescent let us kill the spirit of weight so learn to laugh your way out of yourselves uplift your hearts ye good dancers high higher and forget not the good laughter this crown to the laughers this rose wreath crown to you my brothers do i dedicate this crown i have pronounced laughter holy ye higher men learn learn to laugh one must have chaos in himself to give birth to a dancing star then the dance song begins ushered in by trills in the flutes and clarinets much further on after a fortissimo stroke of the bell comes the song of the night wanderer in the later editions of his book nietzsche gave the corresponding chapter the title drunken song on the twelve strokes of the heavy heavy humming bell Brumglock. he wrote the following lines one o man take heed two what speaks the deep midnight three i have slept i have slept four i have awakened out of a deep dream five the world is deep six and deeper than the day thought for seven deep is woe eight joy deeper still than heart sorrow nine woe speaks vanish ten yet all joy wants eternity eleven wants deep deep eternity twelve the composition ends mystically in two keys in b major in the high woodwind and violins in c major in the basses pizzicati zarathustra's downfall end of section thirty two Chapter thirty three of Stories of Symphonic Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Symphonic Music by Lawrence Gilman. Section thirty three Strauss, Part two Don Quixote. Fantastic variations on a theme of knightly character opus thirty five the full title of this work composed in eighteen ninety seven is don quixote introduzione tema con variazioni e finale fantastische variationen über eine tema ritterlichen charactus that is to say it is in the form of a theme with variations the theme is of knightly character and the variations are fantastic from the programmatic point of view it is a series of tone pictures in which are set forth upon a musical canvas of singular vividness 
the figures of cervantes knight of the rueful countenance and his squire sancho panza and their memorable adventures in quest of knightly glory the orchestral score contains no programme or explanatory notes save two superscriptions printed above the dual portions of the theme identifying the first part with don quixote the second part with sancho panza yet strauss with his inveterate lack of consistency in such matters has annotated the pianoforte arrangement of his music with a completeness which he has capriciously denied to the orchestral score placing at the head of each variation a verbal clue to the particular adventure which the music aims to describe from these it is possible to follow its meaning in fairly ample detail the music consists of an introduction a theme ten variations and a finale continuous throughout each variation is concerned with some incident in cervantes novel a solo cello represents or enacts don quixote a solo viola sancho panza introduction don quixote is deep in the perusal of old romances of errant chivalry grandiose and splendid pictures pass through his mind and inflame his imagination he beholds dulcinea dulcinea the ideal woman oboe melody he sees her beset by giants and rescued by a knight his fantasy was filled with those things that he read of enchantments quarrels battles challenges wounds wooings loves tempests and other impossible follies and in the end through his little sleep and much reading he dried up his brains in such sort as he lost wholly his judgment the strain becomes unbearable the orchestra utters confused and insane and wildly chaotic thoughts until finally in some terrible chords that give one the sensation of an overstretched spring snapping violently we realize that the night is at last quite mad he has determined on a life of chivalry theme the two-part theme is announced don quixote being limbed by a phrase pathetically grandiose for solo cello moderato sancho panza by a burly and grotesquely comic theme first heard on the tenor tuba and bass clarinet but afterwards confined to a solo viola variation one don quixote and sancho panza set forth the knight and his squire set forth on their quest of chivalric adventure the don inspired by the thought of the lovely dulcinea del toboso the theme of the ideal woman the sight of windmills revolving in the breeze inspires his valor he charges them and is overthrown by the sails variation two the victorious battle with the host of the great emperor aliphon Farin. out of a cloud of dust strings don quixote perceives the approach of an army sancho sees that it is a flock of sheep the muted brass instruments in the orchestra imitate their bleating and seeks to restrain the enthusiasm of his master don quixote charges valiantly and puts the enemy to rout variation three colloquies of knight and squire don quixote and sancho panza argue concerning the reasonableness of a life of chivalry the don waxes eloquent over the glory of a knightly career in an orchestral passage developed out of his own theme and that of dulcinea of striking fervor and nobility sancho advocates the homely and attainable things of reality we hear a fragment of his motif but the don silences him angrily variation four the encounter with the pilgrims 
the knight and his squire fall in with a band of pilgrims a theme of ecclesiastical character for the wind instruments don quixote imagines them to be villains and malefactors he attacks them and is worsted falling senseless he revives slowly and sancho relieved lies down beside him and sleeps variation five the knight's vigil beside his arms don quixote following the knightly custom refrains from sleep and watches beside his arms through the night ecstatically he perceives dulcinea as in a vision the theme of the ideal woman is heard variation six the meeting with dulcinea sancho panza assures the don that a certain vulgar peasant girl whom they meet is his adored dulcinea we hear the ideal woman theme transformed into a common and trivial tune woodwind and tambourine don quixote is incredulous he angrily ascribes the effect to some magical agency variation seven the ride through the air sitting stationary with bandaged eyes on a wooden horse the knight and his squire believe that they are being borne through the air we hear in the orchestra the whistling of the wind here enters the famous wind machine the themes of the don and of sancho are giddily borne aloft on the instrumental breeze a long-held note on the bassoon indicates their sudden stop their realization as they look about them that they have not left the earth variation eight the journey in the enchanted boat the knight perceiving an empty boat and being convinced that it is miraculously intended for his use embarks in it with his squire for the accomplishment of some predestined deed of chivalry the orchestra plays a graceful barcarolle the boat upsets but the two reach shore in safety they offer up thanks for their escape a religious passage for the wind instruments variation nine the conflict with the two sorcerers don quixote meets two wayfarers whom he takes to be the magicians whose sorcery has worked him ill they are merely a pair of inoffensive monks but the knight attacks them with victorious results variation ten the combat with the knight of the silver moon and the overthrow of don quixote the bachelor samson carrasco the knight of the silver moon one of don quixote's townsmen does battle with him for the sake of his own good and to cure him of his delusions so to have him in his own house i thought upon this device the music portrays the contest between them which is thus described by cervantes they both of them set spurs to their horses and the knight of the white moons being the swifter met don quixote ere he had run a quarter of his career so forcibly without touching him with his lance for it seemed he carried it aloft on purpose that he tumbled horse and man both to the ground and don quixote had a terrible fall so he got straight up on top of him and clapping his lance's point upon his visor said you are vanquished knight and a dead man if you confess not according to the conditions of our combat don quixote all bruised and amazed without heaving up his visor as if he had spoken out of a tomb with a faint and weak voice said dulcinea del toboso is the fairest woman in the world and i the unfortunatest knight on earth and it is not fit that my weakness defraud this truth thrust your lance into me knight and kill me since you have bereaved me of my honour not so truly quoth he of the white moon let the fame of my lady dulcinea's beauty live in her entireness i am only contented that the grand don quixote retire home for a year or till such time as i please as we agreed before we began the battle and don quixote answered that 
so nothing were required of him in prejudice of his lady dulcinea he would accomplish all the rest like a true and punctual knight don quixote defeated broken-hearted his illusions vanishing one by one rides homeward with his squire in profound dejection and here the orchestra evolves out of a pathetic variant of his theme an eloquent and vivid commentary finale the death of don quixote the knight once more a sane and wise man his brain cleared of its mists his reason restored lies dying peacefully on his bed they stood all gazing one upon the other, wondering at Don Quixote's sound reasons, although they made some doubt to believe them. One of the signs which induced them to conjecture that he was near unto death's door was that with such facility he was from a stark fool become a wise man, for to the words already alleged he had added many more so significant, so Christian-like, and so well couched that without doubt they confidently believed that Don Quixote was become a right wise man. Amidst the wailful plaints and blubbering tears of the bystanders, he yielded up the ghost. That is to say, he died. The music, which portrays his end, is simple and very peaceful. The chords, which at the beginning indicated his aberration, are now orderly, tranquil, and composed. A Hero's Life, Ein Heldenleben, Tone Poem, Opus 40. Ein Heldenleben was completed in December of 1898. The score bears absolutely no indication of its purport or significance, save the title. We are left to guess whether the hero, whose life is celebrated therein, is an ideal hero or a figure of history, of myth, of romance or of private life. Strauss is said to have observed, in response to a question, there is no need of a program. It is enough to know there is a hero fighting his enemies. Yet the analysts have been busy with this score as with others by Strauss, and he has at least by implication sanctioned their interpretations. A hero's life is in six connected sections, arranged and identified as follows the hero, the hero's adversaries, the hero's consort, the hero's battlefield, the hero's works of peace, the hero's retirement from the world, and the end of his striving. 1. The Hero We hear the first theme of the hero, a chivalric and wide-arched phrase of extraordinary breadth and energy, announced forte by horns viola and cellos subsidiary themes follow picturing various aspects of his nature his pride emotional nature iron will richness of imagination and so forth the main theme weightily proclaimed by tenor and bass tubas four horns double basses cellos and woodwind brings the first section to a thunderous close two the hero's adversaries herein are pictured the hero's opponents and detractors an envious and malicious crew rich in all its uncharitableness the woodwind instruments flutes oboes english horn clarinets utter shrill and snarling phrases Besides them, the spiteful cackling of the woodwind in the Meistersinger overture is as the amorous murmuring of doves. There is also an uncouth and sluggish phrase for tenor and bass tubas, intended to picture the malevolence of the dull-witted among the foe. The theme of the hero, in a sad and meditative guise, pictures his dignified amazement his pained and sorrowful surprise that his adversaries should so reveal the smallness and meanness and acrimony of their natures a poignant phrase of parsifal like colour and profile muted strings speaks of his temporary disquietment perhaps his doubt of his own sublimity 
but this is barely hinted at his dauntless courage reasserts itself and the mocking and contemptible horde are put at least for the time to root three the hero's consort a solo violin in a long and elaborate passage introduces the hero's beloved she is pictured at first as capricious a coquette but the music grows more tender more gentle the full orchestra enters the oboe sings an expressive melody there are rapturous and passionate phrases for the strings amid sweeping arpeggios in the harps and the love scene reaches its climax the mocking voices of the foe are heard remotely like the distant croaking of the night birds through an ecstatic dream they are powerless to disturb the peace and felicity of the lovers for the hero's battlefield but now the call to battle sounds and it may not be ignored distant fanfares of trumpets summon the hero to the conflict the orchestra becomes a battlefield the music is chaos tumultuous cataclysmic it evokes the picture of countless and waging hosts of forests of waving spears and clashing blades the din heat and turmoil of conflict are spread all over and the ground piled high with the slain through the dust and din we are reminded of the inspiration of the beloved which urges on and enheartens the champion whose motive contests for supremacy with that of his adversaries a triumphant orchestral outburst on the hero's theme proclaims at last his victory yet he rejoices alone the world regards his conquest with cold and cynical indifference five the hero's works of peace now begins a celebration of the hero's victories of peace his spiritual evolution and achievements this section is introduced by a reminder of the uncouth phrase for tenor and bass tuba heard in the second division the heroic and tender themes of the preceding pages are recalled and with them are woven a significant indication of the true subject of the tone poem quotations of themes from strauss's earlier works we hear in surprising and subtle combinations reminiscences of don juan thus spake zarathustra death and transfiguration don quixote till Eulenspiegel's merry pranks the music drama guntram and macbeth and the famous and lovely song trim durch die dammerung industrious commentators have discovered twenty-three of these quotations six the hero's retirement from the world and the end of his striving again we hear in the tubas the uncouth and cacophonous phrase which voices the dull contempt of the benighted adversaries even the glorious achievements of the hero's brain his spiritual conquests have won only envy and derision the protagonist rebels mightily there are passionate and tempestuous phrases reminiscences of his theme in the strings horns and woodwind but his mood quiets over a persistent tapping of the kettle drum the english horn intones a gentler version of his theme an agitating memory of the striving and conflict of the past disturbs but only for a moment the serenity of his mood we are reminded of the consoling presence of the beloved one peace descends upon the spirit of the hero the close is majestic and be nine. Domestic Symphony, Opus 53. In the course of an interview published in London in 1902, Strauss made this announcement. My next tone poem will illustrate a day in my family life. It will be partly lyrical, partly humorous, a triple fugue, the three subjects representing Papa, Mama, and the Baby. The Symphonia Domestica, composed in 1903, was published in 1904. The first performance anywhere was at Carnegie Hall, New York, March 21, 1904. The symphony, which bears this dedication, Meine Liebenfrau, 
und unserem Jungen gewidmet, dedicated to my dear wife and our boy, is in one movement and three subdivisions. One, introduction and scherzo, two, adagio, three, double fugue and finale. The composer declined, at the time of the first performance of the symphony, to furnish any program for the music. When the work was produced in Berlin, December 12, 1904, under the direction of the composer, the program books contained this, presumably authorized, annotation of the music. 1. Introduction and development of the three chief groups of themes, the husband's themes, easygoing, dreamy, fiery, the wife's themes, lively and gay, grazioso, the child's theme, tranquil. 2. Scherzo, parent's happiness, child's play, cradle song, the clock strikes seven in the evening. 3. Adagio, doing and thinking, love scene, dreams and cares, the clock strikes seven in the morning. 4. Finale. Awakening and merry dispute. Double fugue. Joyous conclusion. A year later, in connection with the first performance in England, an official description was published, and it was intimated that this description was allowed by the composer to be made public. It is therefore reproduced here, since there is every reason to believe that it constitutes an authentic interpretation of the music. Introduction. The symphony is concerned with three main themes, that of the husband, that of the wife, and that of the child. The husband theme is divided into three sections, the first of which is marked gemächlich, easygoing or deliberate, given out by the cellos. The second, sinend, meditative, oboe. And the third, feurig, fiery, violins. The first section of the symphony, the introduction, is devoted to an exposition and treatment of the chief themes or groups of themes, its most striking feature being the introduction of the child theme on the oboe de amour, an instrument which has practically fallen out of use. The composer himself has spoken of this theme as being of almost Haydnesque simplicity. On this follows a very characteristic passage which has been interpreted as representing the child in its bath. Scherzo. The scherzo bears the headings Elternglück, Kindliche Spiele, Parents' Happiness, the Child at Play. Its chief theme is the child theme in a new rhythm. At its end, the music suggestive of the bath recurs and the clock strikes seven. We then come to the lullaby, where we have another version of the child theme. Adagio. The subheadings of the Adagio are Schaffen und Schauen, Liebes Sina, Träume und Sorgen, Doing and Thinking, The Love Scene, Dreams and Cares. This elaborate section introduces no new themes of any importance and is really a symphonic, slow movement of great polyphonic elaboration and superlatively rich orchestral color. The gradual awakening of the family is next depicted by a change in the character of the music, which becomes more and more restless, the use of rhythmical variants of previous themes being very ingenious. And then there is another reference to the bath music, and the glockenspiel indicates that it is 7 a.m. Finale. In this way we reach the final fugue. The principal subject of this is also a new version of the child theme. Its subtitle is Lustige Streit, Friedrich Bischofs, Merry Argument and Happy Conclusion, the subject of the dispute between father and mother being the future of the son. The fugue, the chief subject of which is another variant of the child theme, is carried on with unflagging spirit and humor and great variety of orchestration. As the fugue proceeds, the child theme gradually grows more and more prominent, and finally seems to dominate the whole score. The child seems to have hurt himself in boisterous play, says another commentator. The mother cares for him, and the father also has a soothing word. Some new themes, all more or less akin to it, and all in the nature of folk tunes, are introduced 
The father and mother, however, soon assume their former importance, and the whole ends with great spirit and in the highest good humor, with an emphatic reassertion of the husband theme with which it began, suggesting that the father had the last word in the argument. End of section 33《Chapter Thirty Four of Stories of Symphonic Music》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Stories of Symphonic Music》by Lawrence Gilman。Section Thirty Four。Tchaikovsky。Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky, born in Votinsky, in the government of Vyatka, Russia, May 7, 1840, died in St. Petersburg, November 6, 1893. Romeo and Juliet, Overture Fantasy, Footnote, Without Opus Number, End of Footnote. Romeo and Juliet, Overture Fantasy After Shakespeare, composed in 1869-70, is the second of Tchaikovsky's programmatic works for orchestra. Footnote. The first of Tchaikovsky's programmatic orchestra works is the virtually unknown Fatum Destiny, to which are attached lines from a poem by Batyushkov. This work was composed in 1868 and produced at Moscow in March of the following year. Tchaikovsky destroyed the score during the 70s, but the orchestral parts were preserved and the score was reconstructed from them and published in 1896. But Yushkov's lines were affixed to the score after its completion, on the eve of the concert at which the work was produced. End of footnote. There is no note of any kind attached to the score, but according to responsible interpreters, the music is concerned with definite aspects of Shakespeare's tragedy. At the start is presented the figure of Friar Lawrence, churchly harmonies in the clarinets and bassoons. Later the conflict of the opposing houses, expressed in a tumultuous passage full of strife and fury. Then follows the love scene, introducing two themes of rich emotional suggestion the first of these themes the rhapsodic and song-like phrase announced by muted violas footnote see page 12 footnote end of footnote an english horn was used by tchaikovsky in the fragmentary duo from romeo and juliet found among his papers after his death where it voices these words sung by Romeo, O nuit d'extase, arrête-toi, O nuit d'amour, étends ton voile noir sur nous, O linger, night of ecstasy, O night of love, spread thy dark veil over us. The second theme, the lovely sequence of chords scored for muted and divided violins forms in the duet the accompaniment to the impassioned dialogue of the enamoured pair in the chamber scene footnote it is known that tchaikovsky thought seriously of composing an opera based on the subject of romeo and juliet the operas of gounod and bellini he wrote in 1870, Do not frighten me, Shakespeare, he truly observed, is not to be found in them. End of footnote. Following the love scene is a resumption of the stress and conflict of the first part, against which the solemn warning of Friar Lawrence protests in vain. The lovers are again evoked with more passionate insistence than before. There is a cumulative moment of arresting intensity. Then, after a brief and portentous silence, a dolorous reminiscence of Romeo's ecstatic song, 
now dirge-like and woeful violins cellos bassoons afterwards declaimed with greater breath in the strings with accompaniment of wood-wind horns and harp brings the music to a close fantasia the tempest opus eighteen during a visit to st petersburg in the winter of eighteen seventy two seventy three tchaikovsky begged his friend vladimir stasov to suggest to him a subject for a symphonic fantasia something he preferred shakespearean stasov responded by sending tchaikovsky a letter proposing the tempest as a theme and outlining in elaborate and enthusiastic detail the poetic and dramatic plan which he conceived should underlie the music this scheme so appealed to tchaikovsky that he announced his determination to carry out every detail and to judge from his own program affixed to the score he actually did so stasov's remarks therefore serve as the best possible commentary on the significance of tchaikovsky's music he wrote as follows i rejoice in the prospect of your work which should prove a worthy pendant to your romeo and juliet see the preceding pages you ask whether it is necessary to introduce the tempest most certainly undoubtedly most undoubtedly without it the entire program would fall through i have carefully weighed every incident with all their pros and cons and it would be a pity to upset the whole business i think the sea should be depicted twice at the opening and close of the work in the introduction i pictured it to myself as calm until prospero works his spell and the storm begins but i think this storm should be different from all others all other orchestral storms in that it breaks out at once in all its fury and does not as generally happens work itself up to a climax by degrees i suggest this original treatment because this particular tempest is brought about by enchantment and not as in most operas oratorios and symphonies by natural agencies when the storm has abated when its roaring screeching booming and raging have subsided the enchanted island appears in all its beauty and still more lovely the maiden miranda who flits like a sunbeam over the island her conversation with prospero and immediately afterwards with ferdinand who fascinates her and with whom she falls in love the love theme crescendo must resemble the expanding and blooming of a flower shakespeare has thus depicted her at the close of the first act and i think this would be something well suited to your muse then i would suggest the appearance of caliban the half-animal slave and then ariel whose motto you may find in shakespeare's lyric at the end of the first act come unto these yellow sands after ariel ferdinand and miranda should reappear this time in a phrase of glowing passion then the imposing figure of prospero who relinquishes his magic arts and takes farewell of his past and finally the sea calm and peaceful which washes the shores of the desert island while the happy inhabitants are borne away in a ship to distant italy how faithfully tchaikovsky adhered to this admirable plan is made evident by the following program which in russian and french prefixes the score the sea ariel spirit of the air obedient to the will of the magician prospero 
evokes a tempest, wreck of the ship which carries Ferdinand, the enchanted isle, first timid steering of love between Miranda and Ferdinand, Ariel, Caliban, the love-lorn couple abandon themselves to the triumphant sway of passion. Prospero lays aside his magical power and quits the isle, the sea. La Tempête was begun early in August 1873 and finished three months later. It is dedicated to Stasov. The work was produced at a concert of the Moscow Musical Society, December 19, 1873. In November of the following year, it was performed in St. Petersburg. Stasov attended a rehearsal and wrote frankly to Tchaikovsky concerning the music of which he was at least part creator. I have just come from the rehearsal from Saturday's concert. Your Tempest was played for the first time. Rimsky, Korsakov, and I sat alone in the empty hall and overflowed with delight. Your Tempest is fascinating, unlike any other work. The Tempest itself is not remarkable or new. Prospero, too is nothing out of the way and at the close you have made a very commonplace cadenza such as one might find in the finale of an italian opera these are three blemishes but all the rest is a marvel of marvels caliban ariel the love scene all belong to the highest creations of art in both love scenes what passion what languor, what beauty! I know nothing to compare with it. The wild, uncouth, Caliban, the wonderful flights of Ariel. These are creations of the first order. In this theme, the orchestration is enchanting. Rimsky and I send you our homage and heartiest congratulations upon the completion of such a fine piece of workmanship. Footnote. This and the foregoing excerpt from Tchaikovsky's correspondence are from the translation by Mrs. Rosa Newmarch. End of footnote. Fantasia. Francesca da Rimini. Opus 32. Tchaikovsky visited Paris in the summer of 1876, and while there sketched the plan of a symphonic poem after Dante, Francesca da Rimini. He had intended to write an opera based on this theme, and had considered a libretto on the subject prepared by one Zvantsiev, but the project was abandoned. In July of that year, he wrote from Paris to his brother, Modeste. Early this morning, I read through the fifth canto of the Inferno, and was beset by the wish to compose a symphonic poem, Francesca da Rimini. On October 26th, he wrote from Moscow, I have just finished a new work, the symphonic fantasia Francesca da Rimini. I have worked on it con amore, and I believe that my love has brought with it success. However, a just estimate of this work is impossible so long as it is not orchestrated and has not been played. The Fantasia was completed in November 1876. Professor to the score is this introduction. Dante arrives in the second circle of hell. He sees that here... The incontinent are punished, and their punishment is to be tormented continually by the crudest winds under a gloomy air. Among these tortured ones, he recognizes Francesca da Rimini, who tells her story. Then follows a quotation from the fifth canto of the Inferno, beginning with Francesca's words. 
nessun maggior dolore che ricordarsi del tempo felice nella miseria. There is no greater pain than to recall a happier time in misery. And ending with the concluding line of the canto, that is to say, 21 lines out of the 140 comprised in the canto, since it is, perhaps, well to recall the entire story as Dante relates it, in order that the scope and significance of Tchaikovsky's music may be understood. I quote the canto from beginning to end in the extraordinarily careful and felicitous translation of Dr. John A. Carlyle. Thus I descended from the first circle down to the second. Footnote. This is Carlyle's concise epitome of the experience related by Dante in the fifth canto, the second circle, or proper commencement of hell, and minus the infernal judge at its entrance. It contains the souls of carnal sinners, and their punishment consists in being driven about incessantly in total darkness by fierce winds. First among them comes Semiramis, the Babylonian queen, Tito, Cleopatra, Helena, Achilles, Paris, and a great multitude of others pass in succession. Dante is overcome and bewildered with the pity at the sight of them when his attention is suddenly attracted to two spirits that keep together and seem strangely light upon the wind. He is unable to speak for some time after finding that it is Francesca da Rimini with her lover, Paolo, and falls to the ground as if dead after he has heard their painful story. End of footnote which encompasses less space and so much greater pain that it stings to wailing. There Minos sits horrific and greens, examines the crimes upon the entrance, judges and sends according as he girds himself. I say that when the ill-born spirit comes before him, it confesses all, and that seeing discerner sees what place in hell is for it, and with his tail makes as many circles round himself as the degrees, the number of grades or circles, he will have to descend. Always before him stands a crowd of them. They go each in its turn to judgment. They tell in here and then are whirled down. O thou who comest to the abode of pain, said Minos to me, leaving the act of that great office when he saw me. Look how thou enterest, and in whom thou trusted. Let's not the wideness of the entrance deceive thee. And my guide to him, why, criest thou, hinder not his fated going? Thus it is willed there where what is willed can be done and ask no more. Now begin the doleful notes to reach me. Now am I come where much lamenting strikes me. I am come into a part void of all light, which blows like the sea in tempest when it is combated by warring winds. The hellish storm, which never rests, leads the spirits with its sweep, whirling and smiting. It vexes them. When they arrive before the ruin, there the shrieks, the moanings, and the lamentation. There they blaspheme the divine power. I learned that to such torment were doomed the carnal sinners who subject reason to lust, and as their wings bear along the starlings at the cold season, in large and crowded troop, so that blast the evil spirits. Hither, thither, down up, it leads them. No hope ever comforts them. Not of rest, 
but even of less pain and as the cranes go changing their lays making a long streak of themselves in the air so i saw the shadows come uttering wails borne by that strife of winds where it i said master who are those people whom the black air does lashes the first of these concerning whom thou seekest to know he then replied was empress of many tongues with the vice of luxury she was so broken that she made lust and law alike in her decree to take away the blame she had incurred she is semiramis of whom we read that she succeeded ninus and was his spouse she held the land which the soldan rules that other is she dido who slew herself in love and broke faith to the ashes of sickles next comes luxurious cleopatra helena i saw for whom so long a time of ill revolved and i saw the great achilles who fought at last with love i saw paris tristan and more than a thousand shades he showed to me and with his finger named them whom love had parted from our life after i had heard my teacher name the olden dames and cavaliers pity conquered me and i was as if bewildered i began poet willingly would i speak with these two that go together and seem so light upon the wind and he to me thou shalt see when they are nearer to us and do thou then entreat them by that love which leads them and they will come soon as the wind bends them to us i raise my voice oh where it is souls come to speak with us if none denies it as doves called by desire with open and steady wings fly through the air to their loved nest borne by their will so those spirits issued from the band where dido is coming to us through the malignant air such was the force of my effectual cry francesca speaks o living creature gracious and benign that goes through the black air visiting us who stained the earth with blood if the king of the universe were our friend we would pray him for thy peace seeing that thou hast pity of our perverse misfortune that which it pleases thee to hear and to speak we will hear and speak with you whilst the wind as now is silent the town footnote ravenna on the coast of that sea to which the po with all his streams from alps to apennines descends to rest the rain and a footnote where i was born sits on the shore where po descends to rest with his attendant streams love which is quickly caught in gentle heart took him with the fair body of which i was bereft and the manner still afflicts me love which to no loved one permits excuse from loving took me so strongly with delight in him that as thou seest even now it leaves me not love led us to one death Caina, the place in the lowest circle of hell occupied by cain and other fratricides waits for him who quenched our life these words from them were offered to us after i had heard those wounded souls i bowed my face and held it low until the poet said to me what art thou thinking of when i answered i begun ah me what sweet thoughts what longing led them to the woeful pass then i turned again to them and i spoke and begun 
Francesca, thy torments make me weep with grief and pity. But tell me, in the time of the sweet sighs, by what and how love granted you to know the dubious desires? And she to me, no greater pain than to recall a happy time in wretchedness. And this thy teacher knows. But if thou hast such desire to learn the first root of our love, I will do like one who weeps and tells. Footnote. Francesca was the daughter of Guido Vecchio da Polenta, lord of Ravenna. She was given in marriage to Giovanni, or Giantiotto, Malatesta, the eldest son of Malatesta Vecchio, tyrant of Rimini. Giovanni was called Lo Sciancato, the lame, or Hipshot. Not only was he a cripple, but he was much older than Francesca, and of stern and forbidding temper. Some say that he secured Francesca for wife by trickery, she being led to suppose that Paolo il Bello, the young brother of Giovanni, a handsome man, very pleasant and of courteous breeding, was her future husband that she therefore permitted herself to love him, and did not learn of the deception until the morning and swing the marriage. Giovanni surprised his wife and his brother together, and killed them both between the years 1287 and 1289, says Hieronymus Rubius, in the first edition of his Historia Ravenat, Venice, 1572. In a later edition, 1603, the date is given as early in 1289. The lovers were buried in the same grave. Guido Novello, with whom Dante lived at Ravenna, was the son of Francesca's brother, Ostagio da Polenta, and from him it is believed Dante heard the tragic story. L.G. End of footnote. One day, for a pastime, we read of Lancelot. Footnote. Lancelot of the Lake, in the old romances of the Round Table, is described as the greatest knight of all the world, and his love for Queen Guinevere, or Gnevra, is infinite. Galeotto, Galeho, or Sir Galahad, is he who gives such a detailed declaration of Lancelot's love to the queen, and is to them in the romance what the book and its author are here in Dante's poem to Francesca and Paolo, J. A. Carlyle. And a footnote, how love constrained him. We were alone and without all suspicion. Several times that reading urged our eyes to meet and changed the color of our faces. But one moment alone it was that overcame us. When we read how the fond smile was kissed by such a lover, he who shall never be divided from me kissed my mouth all trembling. The book and he who wrote it was a galeotto, that day we read in it no further. Footnote. This is the culmination of the scene described by Francesca as it occurs in Mr. Stephen Phillips' drama, Paolo and Francesca. Francesca reading. Anne Guinevere turning, beheld him suddenly whom she loved in her thought. And even from that hour, when first she saw him, for by day, by night though lying by her husband's side did she weary for lancelot and knew full well how ill that love and yet that love how deep i cannot see the page is dim read you paolo reading now they two were alone yet could not speak but heard the beating of each other's hearts he knew himself a traitor but to stay yet could not steer 
she pale and yet more pale grew till she could no more but smiled on him then when he saw that wished smile he came near to her and still near and trembled then her lips all trembling kissed francesca drooping towards him oh lancelot he kisses her on the lips and a footnote whilst the one spirit thus spoke the other wept so that i fainted with pity as if i had been dying and fell as a dead body falls the opening section andante lugubre of tchaikovsky's fantasia evokes the sinister and dreadful scene which greeted dante and virgil as they entered the region of the second circle the tempestuous winds the wailing of the damned the appalling gloom and horror of the place pale tormented shadowy figures approach the increasing number orchestral spasm follow spasm and then there is rest there is awful silence there follows a low in the whirlwind in the theme heard at the beginning horns cornet trombones announces solemnly the approach of francesca and paolo the woodwind takes the theme and a recitative leads to the second section of the fantasia andante cantabile non troppo in this section the apparition of the two lovers is brought before us this middle part is especially beautiful observes a german annotator on account of the original and vaporous accompaniment by three flutes of the chief theme the motive of the first section enters cello as the thought of remorse but a delightful melody of the english horn and delicate harp chords dispel the gloomy thoughts and the picture of the two happy in their all-absorbing passionate but disastrous love is maintained we seem says mrs rosa newmarch of this passage to hear the spirit voice of francesca herself from which all the horrors of hell have not taken the sweetness of human love and poignant memory when the lamenting ghosts re-enter largamente wind instruments then in the strings the lovers vanish in an orchestral storm sun signs in his lively portraits a souvenirs make some interesting comments on the music the gentlest and kindest of men he writes has let loose a whirlwind in this work and shows us little pity for his interpreters and hearers as satan for sinners here speaks the invincible classicist a long melodic phrase the love song of paolo and francesca soars above this tempest this bufera infernale which attracted liszt before tchaikovsky and engendered his dante symphony see pages one hundred sixty four one hundred seventy three liszt's francesca is more touching and more italian in character than that of the great slavonic composer the whole work is so typical that we seem to see the profile of dante projected in it tchaikovsky's art is more subtle the outlines clearer the material more attractive from a purely musical point of view the work is better Liszt's version is perhaps more to the taste of the poet or painter on the whole they can fitly stand side by side either of them is worthy of dante end of part one Tchaikov's continued this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. stories of symphonic music by lawrence gilman tchaikovsky continued 
Symphony number no. four in F minor, opus thirty six. Number one, Andante sostenuto, moderato con anima in movimento di valse. Number two, Andantino in modo di canzona. Number three, Scherzo, pizzicato ostinato allegro. Number four, Finale. Allegro con fuoco. Tchaikovsky began this symphony in 1876 and completed it in the winter of 1877-78. The score bears the dedication to my best friend. And behind the phrase lies a singular history too long to be told here in full. The best friend was Nadezhda Filaretovna von Meck. Footnote. Nadezhda Filaretovna von Meck was born in the village of Znamensky in the government of Smolensky, February 10th, 1831. She was thus nine years older than Tchaikovsky when her husband, an engineer, died in 1876. She was left with eleven children and a very large fortune, although they had not always been rich. Modeste Tchaikovsky described her as a proud and energetic woman of strong convictions, with the mental balance and business capacity of a man, a woman who despised all that was petty, commonplace, and conventional. Absolutely free from sentimentality in her relations with others, yet capable of deep feeling and of being completely carried away by what was lofty and beautiful. End of footnote. A widow living in Moscow, exceedingly wealthy, she deeply admired the music of Tchaikovsky. She inquired concerning his pecuniary circumstances, and learning that his means were straightened and that he was in debt, she sent him in the summer of 1877 the sum of 3,000 rubles. A correspondence had meanwhile begun between them. The first letter from Mrs. von Meck is dated December 30th, 1876. She had given Tchaikovsky certain small commissions to do for her, transcriptions for violin and piano of certain of his works which she wished made, and for these she paid him general fees. In the autumn of 1877 she asked him, with many apologies, to permit her to settle upon him an annual allowance of 6,000 rubles, about three thousand dollars that he might compose undisturbed by material cares if i wanted something from you she wrote of course you would give it me is it not so very well then we cry quits do not interfere with my management of your domestic economy peter Ilitch. she desired and insisted that they should never meet or personally known each other the more you fascinate me the more i shrink from knowing you she wrote tchaikovsky accepted the settlement and respected her wish concerning their intercourse i can only serve you wrote the composer by means of my music nadezhda filaretovna every note which comes from my pen in future is dedicated to you they corresponded frequently at length and with the deepest intellectual and spiritual intimacy, but they never met. When they accidentally came face to face, writes Tchaikovsky's brother Modeste, they passed as total strangers. To the end of their days, they never exchanged a word. Their correspondence, which extended over thirteen years, was abruptly and lamentably ended. In December 1890, Tchaikovsky received a letter from his patroness informing him that she was on the brink of ruin and that she would be obliged to discontinue his allowance, this despite the fact that she had more than once 
declared to him that no matter what occurred, his annuity was assured to him for life. As it happened, this curtailment of his income did not greatly affect Tchaikovsky's pecuniary situation, for he had come to know prosperity with his increasing fame, but he suffered keen anxiety on his friend's account. Not long after, it turned out that Mrs. von Mack's fortune was not seriously affected after all. A turn of events, which, however, brought misery to the hypersensitive soul of Tchaikovsky. He persuaded himself that Mrs. von Mack's announcement had been merely an excuse to get rid of him on the first opportunity, that he had been mistaken in idealizing his relations with his best friend, that his allowance had long since ceased to be the outcome of a generous impulse. Such were my relations with her, he wrote at this time to a friend, that I never felt oppressed by her generous gifts, but now they weigh upon me in retrospect. My pride is hurt, my faith in her unfailing readiness to help me, and to make any sacrifice for my sake is betrayed. He thought of returning to her in full the money she had settled upon him, but feared to mortify her. He endeavored, both frankly and diplomatically, to renew their intercourse, but to no avail. She made no response, whatever to his attempts to continue their relationship, either through letters or in response to overtures made by Tchaikovsky through mutual friends. He learned that she was ill, ill of a terrible nervous disease, which changed her relations not only to him, but to others. Yet no illness, no misfortune, it seemed to him, could, as he wrote, change the sentiments which were expressed in her letters. I would sooner, he declared, have believed that the earth could fail beneath me than that our relations could suffer change. But the inconceivable has happened, and all my ideas of human nature, all my faith in the best of mankind, have been turned upside down. My peace is broken, and the share of happiness fate has allotted me is embittered and spoiled. Two years later, on his deathbed, her name was constantly and feverishly on his lips. In an indignant or reproachful tone, says Modeste. In the broken phrases of his last delirium, these words alone were intelligible to those around him. Footnote. The passages quoted from Tchaikovsky's letters are given in Mrs. Rosa Newmark's translation. End of footnote. Nadezhda von Mack survived him by only two months. She died January 25th, 1894. The fourth symphony is closely bound up with this singular experience. Not only is it dedicated to Tchaikovsky's devoted benefactress, but he speaks of it repeatedly in his correspondence with her as our symphony. May this music, which is so intimately associated with the thought of you, he wrote to her in November 1877, speak to you and tell you that I love you with all my heart and soul, all my best and incomparable friend. That the symphony has a well-defined program we know on the authority of the composer himself, though the score bears no descriptive title or prefatory note of any kind. Writing to Mrs. von Meck from Florence in March 1878, Tchaikovsky sent this exposition of his music, which he accompanied with thematic illustrations. You ask if in composing this symphony I had a special program in view. For our symphony, there is a program. That is to say, it is possible to express its contents in words, and I will tell you, and you alone, the meaning of the entire work and of its separate movements. Naturally, I can do so only as regards its general features. Number one. 
andante sostenuto, moderato con anima, in movimento di valse. The introduction is the kernel, the quintessence, the chief thought of the whole symphony. Tchaikovsky quotes the stern and threatening opening theme, announced by horns and bassoons, andante. This is fate, the fatal power which hinders one in the pursuit of happiness from gaining the goal, which jealously provides that peace and comfort do not prevail, that the sky is not free from clouds, a might that swings, like the sword of Damocles, constantly over the head that poisons continually the soul. This might is overpowering and invincible. There is nothing to do but to submit and vainly to complain. Tchaikovsky quotes here the expressive theme for strings, moderato con anima. The feeling of despondency and despair grows ever stronger and more passionate. It is better to turn from the realities and to lull one's self in dreams. Clarinet solo, accompanied by strings. Oh joy, what a lovely and gentle dream. A radiant being, promising happiness, floats before me and beckons me on. The importunate first theme of the Allegro is now heard afar off, and now the soul is wholly enwrapped with dreams. There is no thought of gloom and cheerlessness. Happiness, happiness, happiness. No, they are only dreams, and fate dispels them. The whole of life is only a constant alternation between the small reality and flattering dreams of happiness. There is no port. You will be tossed hither and thither by the waves until the sea swallows you. This, approximately, is the program of the first movement. Number two, Andantino in modo di canzona. The second movement shows suffering in another stage. It is a feeling of melancholy such as feels one when one sits alone at home, exhausted by work. The book has slipped out of one's hand. A swarm of memories arise in one's mind. How sad that so much has been and is gone. And yet it is pleasant to think of the days of one's youth. We regret the past and have neither the courage nor the desire to begin a new life. We are weary of life. We wish refreshment, retrospection. We think of happy hours when our young blood still sparkled and effervesced and life brought satisfaction. We think of moments of sadness and irrepressible losses. But these things are far away, so far away. It is sad, yet sweet, to pour over the past. Number three, it's Kerso. Pizzicato ostinato, allegro. No definite feelings find expression in the third movement. These are capricious arabesques and tangible figures which flit through the fancy as if one had drunk wine and become slightly intoxicated. The mood is neither merry nor sad. We think of nothing but give free rein to the fancy which humors itself in drafting the most singular lines. Suddenly there arises the memory of a drunken peasant and a ribald song. Military music passes by in the distance. Such are the disconnected images which flit through the brain as one sinks into slumber. They have nothing to do with reality, they are incomprehensible, bizarre, fragmentary. Number four, finale, allegro con fuoco. Fourth movement. If you find no pleasure in yourself, look about you. Go to the folk. See how it understands to be jolly, how it surrenders itself to gaiety. The picture of a folk holiday. Scarcely have you forgotten yourself. 
scarcely have you had time to be absorbed in the happiness of others before untiring fate again announces its approach the other children of men are not concerned with you they neither see nor feel that you are lonely and sad how they enjoy themselves how happy they are and will you maintain that everything in the world is sad and gloomy there is still happiness simple native happiness rejoice in the happiness of others and you can still live this is all that i can tell you my dear friend about the symphony manfred symphony in four tableau opus 58 number one lento lugubre andante number two scherzo vivace con espirito number three pastorale andante con motto number four finale allegro con fuoco the symphony is frankly program music it is not listed among tchaikovsky's symphonies where in order of composition and opus number it would stand between the fourth opus thirty six eighteen seventy six seventy eight and the fifth opus sixty four eighteen eighty eight manfred symphony in four tableau after the dramatic poem by byron was composed in eighteen eighty five the score contains the following preface printed in french and russian one manfred wanders in the alps tortured by the fatal anguish of doubt racked by remorse and despair his soul is a prey to sufferings without a name neither the occult science whose mysteries he has probed to the bottom and by means of which the gloomy powers of hell are subject to him nor anything in the world can give him the forgetfulness to which alone he aspires the memory of the fair astarte whom he has loved and lost eats his heart nothing can dispel the curse which weighs on manfred's soul and without cessation without truce he is abandoned to the tortures of the most atrocious despair number two the fairy of the alps appears to manfred beneath the rainbow of the waterfall number three pastorale simple free and peaceful life of the mountaineers number four the underground palace of arimanes manfred appears in the midst of a bacchanal invocation of the ghost of astarte she foretells him the end of his earthly woes manfred's death footnote translated by mr philip hale end of footnote number one lento lugubre andante manfred's despair and anguish his inextinguishable longing and remorse his fruitless quest after forgetfulness form the emotional and dramatic burden of this movement manfred's theme is heard at the beginning a sombre and tragic motive for bassoons and bass clarinet there are also musical symbols for his passionate appeal for oblivion for his occult powers and for the thought of astarte the movement should not be considered as panoramic in any sense there is no attempt to depict any special scene to translate into music any particularly soliloquy it is the soul of manfred that the composer wishes to portray number two scherzo vivace con espirito this movement was suggested by the second scene of act two of byron's drama in which manfred beside the cataract evokes the witch of the alps tells her of astarte and of his own remorse and longing and although she intimates that she may help him rejects her aid 
for he is not willing to swear obedience to her will. As the scene in the poem may be regarded as a picturesque episode, for the incantation is fruitless and only one of many, so the music is a relief after the tumultuous passion and raging despair of the first movement. The vision of the dashing, glistening cataract continues until with note of triangle and chord of harp the rainbow is revealed to the accompaniment of mysterious and ethereal harp tones mumfred conjures up the witch who rises beneath the arch of the sunbow of the torrent her song is suggested violins and harps there is a poignant reminiscence of manfred's despair the glory of the cataract is once more seen. It pales as the theme of despair is heard again. Number three, Pastorale, Andante con Moto. This scene is general in its suggestiveness. It has no definite connection with any particular scene in Byron's poem. The opening is idyllic, but the mood of the music is soon altered. Again, we are reminded of Manfred's unalterable woo. Perhaps Tchaikovsky had in mind here a tense passage in the scene between Manfred and the chamois hunter. Act two, scene one. Manfred, thinks thou existence does depend on time? It does, but actions are our epochs mine have made my days and nights imperishable endless and all alike as sands on the shore innumerable atoms and one desert barren and cold on which the wild waves break but nothing rests save carcasses and wrecks rocks and the salt surf weeds of bitterness chamois hunter alas he's mad but yet I must not leave him. Manfred, I would I wear, for then the things I see would be but a distempered dream. Chamois Hunter, what is it that thou dost see, or think thou lookest upon? Manfred, myself and thee, a peasant of the Alps, thy humble virtues, hospitable home, and spirit patient, pious, proud, and free, thy self-respect ingrained on innocent thoughts. This do I see, and then I look within. It matters not, my soul was escorted already. Number four, finale, allegro con fuoco. This bacchanal in the underground palace of Arimanes is Tchaikovsky's own invention. There is no bacchanal or suggestion of one in the corresponding scene in Byron's poem, where Arimanes, seated on his throne of fire, is surrounded by spirits who praise him in a worshipful hymn. At the climax of the music's wild revealing, the motive of despair is recalled. The music becomes uncanny, mysterious. We hear the theme of Manfred. Nemesis, who has entered the hall together with the destinies, invokes the wraith of Astarte. Manfred, can this be death? There's bloom upon her cheek. But now I see it is no living hue, but a strange hectic like the unnatural red which autumn plants upon the perished leaf. It is the same, O oh God, that I should dread to look upon the same, Astarte. No, I cannot speak to her, but bid her speak. Forgive me or condemn me. Phantom of Astarte. Manfred. Manfred, say on, say on. I live but in the sound. It is thy voice. Phantom. Manfred, tomorrow ends thine earthly ills. Farewell. Manfred, yet one word more. Am I forgiven? Phantom. Farewell. 
Manfred, say, shall we meet again? Phantom, farewell. Manfred, one word for mercy, say thou lovest me. Phantom, Manfred. The spirit of Astarte disappears. Nemesis, she is gone and will not be recalled. Her words will be fulfilled. Return to the earth. A spirit, he is convulsed. This is to be a mortal and seek the things beyond mortality. The music rises to a momentous and tragic climax. Manfred's death theme is brought before us. We are in the tower of his castle. Night approaches. The importunate demons have disappeared. Manfred and the abbot are alone. Act three, scene four. The abbot. Alas, how pale thou art. Thy lips are white, and thy breast heaves, and in thy gasping throat the accents rattle. Give thy prayers to heaven, pray, albeit but in thought, but die not thus. Manfred, tis over, my dull eyes can fix thee not, but all things swim around me, and the earth heaves as it were beneath me. Fare thee well, give me thy hand. Abbot, cold, cold, even to the heart, but yet one prayer. Alas, how fares it with thee? Manfred, old man, tis not so difficult to die. Manfred expires. Abbot, he's gone. His soul has taken his earthless flight. Whither? I dread to think. But he is gone. Symphony number no. six. Pathetic. Opus seventy four. Number one. Adagio. Allegro non troppo. Number two. Allegro con grazia. Number three. Allegro molto vivace. Number four. Finale. Adagio Lamentoso. Tchaikovsky wrote to Vladimir Davidov on February 23rd, 1893. Just as I was starting on my journey to visit to Paris in December 1892, the idea came to me for a new symphony, this time with a program, but a program which should be a riddle to all. Let them guess it who can. The work will be entitled A Program Symphony No. 6. This program is penetrated by subjective sentiment. During my journey, while composing it in my mind, I have often wept bitterly. Now that I am home again, I have settled down to sketch out the work, and I work at it with such ardor that in less than four days I have finished the first movement while the other movements are clearly outlined in my mind. There will be much, as regards the form, that will be novel in this work. For instance, the finale will not be a boisterous allegro, but on the contrary, an extended adagio. Six months later, he wrote to Davidov that the symphony was progressing and that he considered it the best especially the most open-hearted of all his works. I love it, as I have never loved any of my musical offspring before. On August 24th, he informed his publisher, Jurgensen, that he had finished orchestrating the symphony, nor did his opinion of it change. It is indescribably beautiful, he wrote, in a fervor of enthusiasm to his brother Modeste and to the Grand Duke Constantine, he wrote on October the 3rd, without exaggeration, I have put my whole soul into this work. It was the last score but one upon which he was to work. Five weeks later, he was dead. Footnote. In the October before his death, 
Tchaikovsky was busied with the orchestration of his third piano concert, Opus 75, based on portions of a symphony which he begun in May 1892, but afterwards destroyed. End of footnote. The symphony was produced at St. Petersburg on October 28th, when it made little impression. It was said that its inspiration stood far below Tchaikovsky's other symphonies. It did not then bear the title Pathetic. How it came to be so named is thus related by Modeste Tchaikovsky. The morning after the concert, I found my brother sitting at the breakfast table with the score of the symphony before him. He had agreed to send the score to Jorgensen, his publisher, that very day, but could not decide upon a title. He did not care to designate it merely by a number, and he had abandoned his original intention of entitling it a program symphony. What would program symphony mean, he said, if I will not give the program? I suggested tragic symphony as an appropriate title, but that did not please him. I left the room while he was still undecided. Suddenly, pathetic occurred to me, and I went back to the room and suggested it. I remember, as though it were yesterday, how he exclaimed, Bravo, Modi! Splendid! Pathetic! And then and there, he added to the score in my presence the title that will always remain. What precisely was in Tchaikovsky's mind when he composed this program symphony? According to Tchaikovsky's intimate friend Nicolas Kashkin, if the composer had disclosed it to the public, the world would not have regarded the symphony as a kind of legacy from one filled with a presentiment of his own approaching end. To him, it seems more reasonable to interpret the overwhelming energy of the third movement and the abysmal sorrow of the finale in the broader light of a national or historical significance, rather than to narrow them to the expression of an individual experience. If the last movement is intended to be predictive, it is surely of things vaster and issues more fatal then are contained in a mere personal apprehension of death. It speaks rather of a lamentation, large a souffrance inconnue, and seems to set the seal of finality on all human hopes. Even if we eliminate the purely subjective interest, this autumnal aspiration of Tchaikovsky, in which we hear the ground whirl of the perished leaves of hope, still remains the most profoundly stirring of his works. No one has speculated with finer tact and sympathy concerning this extraordinary human document than has Mr. Philip Hale, whose meditations may well serve as a comment upon the character of the music. Each hearer has his own thoughts when he is reminded by the instruments to some the symphony is as the life of man. The story is to them of man's illusions, desires, loves, struggles, victories, and end. In the first movement, they find with the despair of old age and the dread of death, the recollection of early years with the transport and the illusions of love, the remembrance of youth, and all that is contained in that world. The second movement might bear as a motto the words of the third calendar in the thousand nights and the night. And we sat down to drink, and some sang songs, and others played lute, and psaltery, and recorders, and other instruments, and the ball went merrily round. Hereupon such gladness possessed me that I forgot the sorrows of the world one and all, 
and said, This is indeed life, O oh, sad, that this fleeting. The trio, footnote, see page 210, end of footnote, is as the sound of the clock that in Poe's wild tale compelled even the musicians of the orchestra to pause momentarily in their performance, to hearken to the sound, and thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company, and while the chimes of the clock yet rung, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows, as if in confused reverie or meditation. In this trio, death beats the drum, with Tchaikovsky here, as in the Manfred symphony, the drum is the most tragic of instruments. The persistent drum beat in this trio is poignant, in despair, not untouched with irony. Man says, come now, I'll be gay, and he tries to sing and to dance and to forget. His very gaiety is labored, forced, constrained, in an unnatural rhythm, and then the drum is heard, and there is wailing, there is angry protest, there is the conviction that the struggle against fate is vain. Again there is the deliberate effort to be gay, but the drum, once heard, beats in the ears forever. The third movement, the march scherzo, is the excuse, the pretext, for the final lamentation. The man triumphs, he knows all that there is in earthly fame. Success is hideous, as Victor Hugo said. The blare of trumpets, the shouts of the mob, may drown the sneers of envy, but at Pompeii, passing Roman streets, at Tasso, with the laurel wreath, at coronation of Tsar, or inauguration of president, death greens, for he knows the emptiness, the vulgarity of what this world calls success. This battle drunk, delirious movement must be forced, precede the mighty wail. The glories of our blood and state are shadows, not substantial things. There is no armor against fate. Death lays his icy hands on kings. The last movement, the prodigious Adagio Lamentoso, moved Mr. Vernon Blackburn to a comparison with Shelley's Adonais. The precise emotions he wrote down to a certain and extreme point, which inspired Shelley in his wonderful expression of grief and despair, also inspired the greatest of modern musicians, since Wagner in his swan song, his last musical utterance on earth. The first movement is the exact counterpart of those lines. He will awake no more, oh, nevermore. Within the twilight chamber spreads a pace, the shadow of white death. As the musician strays into the darkness and into the miserable oblivion of death, Tchaikovsky reaches the full despair of those older lines. We decay like corpses in a charnel. Fear and grief convulse us and consume us day by day, and cold hopes swarm like worms within our living clay. With that mysterious and desperate hopelessness, the Russian comes to an end of his faith and anticipation. For as life, writes Shelley, like a many-colored dome of glass, stains the white radiance of eternity. Even so, Tchaikovsky in this symphony has stained eternity's radiance. He has captured the years and bound them into a momentary emotional pang. The Voivod Orchestral Ballad Posthumous Opus 78 Footnote Voivod in Russian a military commander, general, or governor of a province. End of footnote 
Tchaikovsky composed Le Voivode at Tiflis in 1890, under the inspiration of a poem by the Polish poet Adam Mickiewicz, 1798-1855. It is said that after the first performance of the work at Moscow in November 1891, Tchaikovsky disheartened over the cool reception of his music by the audience and by the adverse criticism of his friends, tore his score in pieces, exclaiming, Such rubbish should never have been written. Footnote. The authorship of this story is attributed to the pianist Alexander Silotti, a pupil of Tchaikovsky. End of footnote. The orchestral parts are alleged to have been preserved and the score restored from them. At all events, the work was published in 1897, four years after Tchaikovsky's death. Mikievich's poem in French and Russian prefaces the score. It has been translated into English prose as follows. Footnote by Mr. Philip Hale. End of footnote. The voivode comes back from the war late at night. He orders silence, rushes toward the nuptial bed, draws aside the curtains. This, then, true. No one. The bed is empty. Darker than black night, he lowers his eyes shot with rage, twists his grizzling moustache, then throwing back his long sleeves, he leaves and bolts the door. Hello there, he cries. Devil's food. Why do I not see at the gate boats or watch dogs? Race of ham. Quick, my gun. Bring a sack, a cord, and take the carbine hanging on the wall. Follow me. I shall make known my vengeance on this woman. The master and the young servant spy along the wall. They go into the garden and see through the bushes the young woman, all in white, seated near the fountain with a young man at her feet. He was saying, And so nothing is left to me of those former delights, of that which I so dearly loved, the size of your white breast, the pressure of your soft hand, these the voivode has bought. How many years did I sigh after you? How many years did I seek you, and you have renounced me? The voivode did not seek you. He did not sigh for you. He made his money jingle, and you gave yourself to him. I have passed through the darkness of the night to see the eyes of my well-beloved, to press her soft hand, to wish her in her new dwelling many prosperous years, much joy, and then to leave her forever. The fair one wept and mourned. The young man embraced her knees, and the other two watched them through the bushes. They laid their guns on the ground. They took cartridges from their belts. They beat them and rammed them home. Then they crept up gently. Master! I cannot aim, said the poor servant. Is it the wind? But there are tears in my eyes. I tremble. My arms are growing weak. There is no priming powder in the pan. Be silent, slave. I'll teach you to whimper. Fill the pan. Now aim. Aim at the forehead of the false woman. More to the left. Higher. I'll take care of the lover. Hush. My turn first. Wait. The carbine shot rang through the garden. The young servant could not wait. The voivode screamed. The voivode staggered. The servant's aim, it seems, was poor. The ball pierced the voivode's forehead. End of section 35「Chapter thirty five of Stories of Symphonic Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Symphonic Music by Lawrence Gilman. Section 35. Wagner. Richard Wagner, born in Leipzig, May 22, 1813. Died in Venice, February 13, 1883. A Faust Overture. Wagner, during his sojourn in Paris in 1840, wrote an orchestral piece, which, as he relates, he called an overture to Goethe's Faust, but which was in reality intended for the first section of a grand Faust symphony. The curious and interesting history of this work may best be told in excerpts from Wagner's correspondence with his devoted friend and benefactor, Franz Liszt. Liszt, to whom Wagner had sent the manuscript of the overture in 1848, wrote in 1852, October 7th, some months after he had produced the overture at Weimar. The work is quite worthy of you, but if you will allow me to make a remark, I must confess that I should like either a second middle part, or else a quieter and more agreeably colored treatment of the present middle part. The brass is a little too massive there, and, forgive my opinion, the motif in F is not satisfactory. It wants grace in a certain sense, and is a kind of hybrid thing, neither fish nor flesh, which stands in no proper relation of contrast to what has gone before and what follows, and in consequence impedes the interest. If instead of this you introduced a soft, tender, melodious part, modulated a la Gretchen, I think I can assure you that your work would gain very much. Think this over, and do not be angry in case I have said something stupid. To this, Fagner responded, November 9, 1852, you beautifully spotted the lie when I try to make myself believe that I had written an overture to Faust. You have felt quite justly what is wanting. The woman is wanting. Perhaps you would at once understand my tone poem if I called it Faust in Solitude. At the time, I intended to write an entire Faust symphony. The first movement, that which is ready, was this solitary Faust longing, despairing, cursing. The feminine floats around him as an object of his longing, but not in its divine reality, and it is just this insufficient image of his longing which he destroys in his despair. The second movement was to introduce Gretchen, the woman. I had a theme for her, but it was only a theme. The whole remains unfinished. I wrote my flying Dutchman instead. This is the whole explanation. If now, from a last remnant of weakness and vanity, I hesitate to abandon this Faust work altogether, I shall certainly have to remodel it, but only as regards instrumental modulation. The theme which you desire I cannot introduce. This would naturally involve an entirely new composition, for which I have no inclination. If I publish it, I shall give it its proper title, Faust in Solitude or The Solitary Faust, a tone poem for orchestra. He did not abandon it. Writing to Liszt from Zurich in January 1855, he congratulated him on the completion of his Faust symphony, and added, It is an absurd coincidence that just at this time I have been taken with a desire to remodel my old Faust overture, I have made an entirely new score, have rewritten the instrumentation throughout, have made many changes, and have given more expansion and importance to the middle portion, the second motif. I shall give it, in a few days at a concert here, under the title of A Faust Overture. The motto will be, Der Gott, der mir im Bus im Wand, kann tief mein Innerstets erregen, der über allen meinen Kräften thront, er kann nach außen nichts bewegen. Und so ist mir das Design einer Last, der Tat er wünscht, das Leben mir verhasst. But I shall not publish it in any case. 
This motto, which Wagner retained, has been translated as follows. The God who dwells within my soul can heave its depths at any hour, who holds over all my faculties control, has over the outer world no power. Existence lies a load upon my breast. Life is a curse, and death a longed-for rest. The overture, in its revised form, was produced in Zurich, January 23, 1855, at a concert at the Allgemeine Musikgesellschaft. Two days later, Liszt wrote to the composer, You were quite right in arranging a new score of your overture. If you have succeeded in making the middle part a little more pliable, this work, significant as it was before, must have gained considerably. Be kind enough to have a copy made and send it me as soon as possible. There will probably be some orchestral concerts here, and I should like to give this overture at the end of February. Wagner sent the score, with a letter, in which he said, Herewith, dearest Franz, you receive my remodeled Faust overture, which will appear very insignificant to you by the side of your Faust symphony. To me the composition is interesting only on account of the time from which it dates. This reconstruction has again endeared it to me, and with regard to the latter, I am childish enough to ask you to compare it very carefully with the first version, because I should like you to take cognizance of the effect of my experience and of the more refined feeling I have gained. In my opinion, new versions of this kind show most distinctly the spirit in which one has learned to work and the coarseness which one has cast off. You will be better pleased with the middle part. I was, of course, unable to introduce a new motif, because that would have involved a remodeling of almost the whole work. All I was able to do was to develop the sentiment a little more broadly, in the form of a kind of enlarged cadence. Gretchen, of course, could not be introduced, only Faust himself. A Siegfried Idol In the summer of 1870, August 25th, Wagner was married at Lucerne, Switzerland, to Cosima, daughter of Franz Liszt, and the Comtesse de Agault, and the divorced wife of Hans von Bülow. Siegfried Wagner, the son of Richard and Cosima, was born at Cheepschen near Lucerne, June 6, 1869. In a letter dated June 25, 1870, two months before his marriage to Cosima, Fagner wrote to a friend. She, Cosima, has defied every disapprobation and taken upon herself every condemnation. She has borne to me a wonderfully beautiful and vigorous boy, whom I could boldly call Siegfried. He is now growing together with my work and gives me a new, long life. Fagner was then fifty-seven years old, which at last has attained a meaning. Thus we get along without the world from which we have retired entirely. But now listen. You will, I trust, approve of the sentiment which leads us to postpone our visit until I can introduce to you the mother of my son as my wedded wife. Cosima, according to Lina Rahman, was born in Bellagio at Christmas, 1837. The Siegfried Idol was written by Wagner as a birthday gift to his wife, and it was first performed December 24, 1871, as an obad on the steps of Wagner's villa at Cheepschen. The orchestra was a small group of players gathered from the neighborhood. Hans Richter played the trumpet, and Wagner himself conducted the themes out of which the idol is evolved are, with a single exception, motifs from the Nibelungen music drama Siegfried, upon which Wagner was engaged when his son was born. The exception is a German cradle song, Schlaf Kindchen Balde, Vöglein Fliegen im Walde, 
Wagner dedicated the work to his wife in verses, which have been translated as follows. Thy sacrifices have shed blessings over me, and to my work have given noble aim, and in the hour of conflict have upbore me, until my labor reached a sturdy frame. Oft in the land of legends we were dreaming, those legends which contain the Teuton's fame, until a sun upon our lives was beaming. Siegfried must be our youthful hero's name. For him and thee I now in tones am praising. What thanks for deeds of love could better be? Within our souls the grateful song upraising, which in this music I have now set free. And in the cadence I have held united, Siegfried, our dearly cherished son, and thee. Thus all the harmonies I now am bringing, but speak the thought which in my heart is ringing. End of section 35、Chapter、36 of Stories of Symphonic Music This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Symphonic Music by Lawrence Gilman. Chapter 36 Wolf. Hugo Wolf, born in Windischgrätz, Steiermark, Austria, March the 13th, 1860. Died in Vienna, February the 22nd, 1903. Penthesilea, Symphonic Poem. Footnote without opus number, would not end. This symphonic poem is based on the tragedy of like name by Heinrich von Kleist. The action of von Kleist's drama is in outline as follows. The Amazons, under the leadership of the queen, Penthesilea, go forth to attack the Greeks besieging Troy, hoping that they may celebrate at Themyscira with the young man whom they shall capture, the Feast of Roses. The law of the Amazons requires that only those whom they have overcome in conquest may celebrate with them at the festival. Therefore, when Penthesilea encounters in battle the surpassingly beautiful Achilles, she perforce attacks him, for she is ravished by love of him. He bests her in the fight, but she is rescued by her sister warriors. Achilles learns that, should he permit her to overcome him, he might possess her. He plans to engage her single-handed and allow her to conquer him. Penthesilea's suspicions are aroused. She becomes convinced of his trickery. Her consuming love is transformed into consuming and vengeful hate. She slays him, and, together with her hounds, rends his flesh and exults lustfully in his blood. When her frenzy, which is as the frenzy of wild Salome, is at last appeased, she steps herself and sinks upon the body of her lover. Dr. Kuno Franke finds in the figure of the Amazon Queen an image of Kleist's own soul. A soul, he writes in his History of German Literature, inspired with titanic daring, driven by superhuman desire, bent on conquering eternity. When the conviction first dawned upon Kleist that the whole of truth is beyond human reach, all life henceforth seemed worthless to him. When Penthesilea, instead of vanquishing the beloved hero, is overcome by him, even his love is hateful to her. The ideal, which she cannot fully and without reserve make hers, she must destroy. The god in her, having been killed, the beast awakes. And thus, immediately, after that enchanting scene where the lovers, 
for the first time and the last, have been reveling in mutual surrender and delight, she falls like a tigress upon the unsuspecting and weaponless man, with the voluptuousness of despair. She sends the arrow through his breast, she lets the hounds loose upon him as he dies, and together with the hounds she tears his limbs and drinks his blood, until at last, brought back to her senses, and realizing what she has done, she sinks into the arms of her death. A character so atrocious and so ravishing, so monstrous and so divine, so miraculous and so true, as no other poet ever has created. Alda Wolf's symphonic poem is not provided with a program. There are in the score explanatory titles for its main connected divisions. These titles have been annotated in German as follows. The translation is that published in the program books of the Chicago Orchestra in April 1904 at the time of the first American performance of the work. First, the departure of the Amazons for Troy. Amid great tumult, the fierce warriors prepare to set out on the campaign, Penthesilea in command, as is symbolized by her personal motive, which will be heard above the clashing of weapons and the shrieking of war cries. In exultation the army assembles, the queen dashing to the front to lead in the march, which begins with a flourish of trumpets. A contrasting intermediary section leads to a resumption of the march movement, the latter dying away as the Amazons, having reached the destination, go into night encampment. As represented by the subdued roars of the kettle drums, with which the movement concludes. Second, Penthesilea's dream of the Feast of Roses. As she slumbers, Penthesilea's dreams carry her beyond the battle, impending to the prize which awaits her after the victory. Over mysterious arpeggios in the violas, the flutes, oboes, and violins begin a melody in which one recognizes Penthesilea, transformed into a gentle, loving woman. The dream picture becomes more and more vivid until all of a sudden the sleeper awakens. Third, combats, passions, frenzy, annihilation. Once aroused, Penthesilea is the ferocious warrior again. Challenged by the foe, she rides forth to battle. But straightway, a conflict of the emotions is suggested by the interweaving of two motives, one being mentioned as denoting Penthesilea's determination to conquer, and the other as expressive of the yearnings of her heart. Their combined development, descriptive of their struggle for supremacy, mounting presently to a full orchestra climax, from which the motive of yearning emerges in certain woodwind instruments over the subdued tremolo of the violas. But the desire for conquest soon gains the upper hand again, leading to a dramatic climax which brings to notice the motive of annihilation in the trombones, opposed by the violence and woodwind with the distorted version of the Penthesilea motif. The tumult subsides through a picturesque diminuendo, beautified by an expressive viola solo, and leading to the reappearance of Penthesilea, now tranquilized and gentle. But this mood does not last long, the orchestra passing from animation to agitation, shortly setting up a great shriek of anguish, following which is a chromatic flourish, leads to a repetition of the departure of the Amazons. But now Penthesilea goes not forth to any common struggle, nor does any dream of happiness beckon her from beyond the victory. Revenge and destruction are now her only purpose. With redoubled ferocity, the situation mounts to its tragic climax, which culminates in a frightful screech. 
then a pause. Her anger spent, the unhappy queen appears once more, her face no longer disfigured with passion, but glowing with yearning and love. Thus, in ecstasy and anguish, her young life goes out in a sigh. End of section 36 End of Stories of Symphonic Music by Lawrence Stillman